All right. Um, welcome to this presentation. The title is Why Intelligent Design Was Not Over at Dover. The occasion is sort of the 10-year anniversary of the Dover ruling. The Dover ruling was issued on December 20th, 2005. And uh, today, obviously, we're about 10 years since that date. And it's a good time to reflect on not just what was wrong with the Dover ruling, but what has happened since the Dover ruling. How some of the predictions that we made uh, at the time of the Dover ruling about what would be the effects on intelligent design have panned out, and also how intelligent design has been doing in the last 10 years. Um, I'd like to first, before we get into this talk too far, give a little bit of my own story, since I actually attended about a third of the Dover trial and watched it in person. Um, so I started working at Discovery Institute in September of 2005. Uh, this was about three weeks before the Dover trial began. So I was not involved personally in the events that led up to the Dover trial, but I was working at Discovery right as the Dover trial began, and I had the opportunity to uh, sit and actually watch in person about one-third of the Dover trial. Um, contrary to what I have heard some people say, actually I was in a chat room recently, and somebody said, oh, Casey Luskin was found by Judge Jones to have lied on the witness stand in the Dover case. That was news to me. I didn't even testify in the Dover case. And he didn't mention, of course, my name or anything I'd done in the Dover ruling. Uh, but I did watch part of the Dover ruling. And uh, although I was not an attorney yet at that time, uh, I certainly was uh, aware of what was going on. And I was involved with some of Discovery Institute's amicus briefs that we filed uh, as sort of an outside uh, party to the case. We were not a party to the Dover case. I should make that clear. Discovery Institute was not sued or being sued in the Dover case. So we had no right to appeal the case. We were not uh, officially involved with the case. The most that we did was that we basically filed some uh, friend of the court briefs called amicus briefs in the Dover case. And so some of the arguments that you're going to hear today are actually taken from our amicus briefs. Um, OK, so a quick um, uh, outline of where we're going to go today. Um, we're going to first go over a very brief summary of the law. What are some of the key legal points and key cases that uh, happened before the Dover case that are helping help to explain the context legally where the Dover case was situated. Uh, then we're going to go over a focus on the Kitzmiller Dover case. We're going to go over a lot of aspects of the Dover ruling. We're going to talk about intelligent design and the supernatural, whether or not Judge Jones was correct to claim that ID uh, requires an appeal to the supernatural. We're going to talk about Judge Jones' claim that ID has made no peer-reviewed publications and also that it has not undergone any testing or research. We're going to talk about this interesting claim Judge Jones made that ID uses this contrived dualism, essentially this claim that ID is simply a negative argument against evolution that has no positive content, and that somehow that makes ID, whether or not that's true, and if it is true, does that make ID sort of an unscientific claim. Or we're going to talk about the double standard that Judge Jones used on the religious implications of intelligent design versus Darwinian evolution. And we're also going to talk about Judge Jones' judicial activism, how he really made some uh, inaccurate claims in his ruling that uh, involved judicial activism. He went beyond what a federal court is supposed to do. Um, we're also going to get into a little bit about Judge Jones' scientific errors. We could write books and books about Judge Jones' scientific errors, but we're just going to scratch the surface today and look at a few of those related to the bacterial flagellum specifically. Uh, we're going to talk about Judge Jones's, what I think is Judge Jones's most uh, dangerous error, which is looking at uh, whether or not a theory is accepted in the scientific community uh, as to whether or not it qualifies as science, and how that could actually dangerously stifle the advancement of scientific knowledge. Uh, we're going to look at why the ruling was so inaccurate. Uh, why are there so many errors in this ruling? How did it happen like that? Uh, we're going to find out there's actually a, a very interesting explanation for why Judge Jones's ruling was so inaccurate. And then finally, we'll close it up with a summary of some of the problems with the Kitzmiller versus Dover ruling, and also look at how ID is thriving in the post-Dover environment. Contrary to many statements by uh, some ID critics, ID is not dead, and it did not die at Dover, and actually ID has been thriving in the last decade since the Dover ruling. OK, so let's jump into this. A brief summary of the law. Um, let's look at some of the major points of law that have happened over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, starting with the first case that the U.S. Supreme Court took to deal with this issue. That was the Epperson versus Arkansas case. It came down in 1968. And in this case, essentially, the U.S. Supreme Court declared it was effectively illegal to prohibit the teaching of evolution. So this is basically saying that not only is it legal to teach evolution, it's essentially Ill illegal if you don't teach evolution. And so this was the first time 
The U.S. Supreme Court ruled on this issue, a very groundbreaking case. And in my opinion, it should be legal to teach evolution. I think evolution can be taught as a science. I think students need to learn about evolution. I think it's a bad idea to ban evolution. So in a sense, I agree with the Supreme Court's holding in this case that it certainly should be legal to teach the scientific evidence supporting evolution. Uh, the next case to, to reach the U.S. Supreme Court was the 1987 case Edwards versus Aguilar. This case dealt with the teaching of creationism, young earth creationism in particular. And in this case, the U.S. Supreme Court essentially declared that teaching creationism is unconstitutional because teaching creationism involves the view that there is a supernatural creator behind all of life. And when you teach that, that is a religious belief according to the Supreme Court in this case, and that's unconstitutional. We'll talk about this case some more later on in this lecture. Um, an interesting point of law that also came out of the 1987 Supreme Court Edwards versus Aguilar case is that it is legal to actually teach scientific critique of prevailing scientific theories like evolution. And again, I would agree with the U.S. Supreme Court very much on this uh, holding, that it is in fact legal to teach scientific critique of prevailing scientific theories like evolution. And this actually laid the groundwork for many current policies. I think there's about 10 states right now that have statewide policies that either require or permit teachers to talk about scientific problems with evolution. And though none of those policies have been struck down in a court. Matter of fact, there hasn't even been a lawsuit to try to take those policies down. And I think that's because the Darwin lobby knows that the U.S. Supreme Court has essentially already declared it legal to teach scientific critique of evolution. And that's why you don't see any uh, lawsuits against, the, against those uh, policies. Uh, another interesting case that came up that I think was a big one was in 1994. Uh, this is where the Ninth Circuit held that a teacher can be required to teach evolution even when it conflicts with their religious beliefs. So if a teacher feels like evolution goes against their personal religious views, uh, okay, well, you can have whatever religious views you want, but a school district can still require you to teach evolution. And then uh, I think the most recent important case that's come down was not from the U.S. Supreme Court. It was not from an appellate court. It was from the lowest level of the federal courts, a federal trial court in Pennsylvania that ruled that intelligent design is a form of creationism and therefore unconstitutional to teach in public schools. That, of course, was the Kitzmiller versus Dover case, and that's our occasion for uh, our discussion today. And you can see from this brief little summary of the law how some of these cases fit together. In 1987, the U.S. Supreme Court held that it is, uh, it is essentially illegal to teach creationism. And so then in 2005, when the Dover case came down, you have a federal court saying that ID is a form of creationism, and then using the Edwards versus Aguilar case as precedent says, okay, because creationism is unconstitutional, so is intelligent design. Uh, we're going to talk today about whether or not ID ought to be considered a form of creationism. I'm going to argue, in my opinion, pretty convincingly that ID is distinct from creationism in some of the most important ways that actually caused creationism to be declared unconstitutional. In fact, ID lacks that key characteristic that caused creationism to be declared unconstitutional in the Edwards versus Aguilar case, and that ID does not involve appealing to a supernatural creator. So we'll see how ID really is different from creationism in a number of important ways and should not be considered unconstitutional. Another little review of the law here is the First Amendment. Of course, that's the context for all of this, right? Uh, what does the U.S. Constitution say about what the government can or cannot do? Uh, well, the first uh, clause of the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, okay, that applies to Congress, but that doesn't apply to school boards, that doesn't apply to state governments. Well, go further down uh, the Constitution and look at the uh, 14th Amendment, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, amendments that were passed in the wake of the Civil War. They essentially applied the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment, to the states. So I'm sorry, but the, this First Amendment, you may think it doesn't apply to uh, other forms of government, like the state government or local governments, like school boards. But according to the 14th Amendment, um, essentially the First Amendment does apply to these other uh, state and local governments. Um, another important uh, law, uh, legal test to understand is the Lemon Test. We're going to get into this some more over the course of this uh, discussion today. But the Lemon Test has essentially been the primary judicial vehicle that has been used since the early 1970s to decide cases involving religion in public schools. Okay? And so the Lemon Test is a three-part test. It comes from the 1971 case, Lemon versus Kurtzman, and it says that 
every government policy has to pass this three-part test in, in order for it to be constitutional. So first, the statute must have a secular legislative purpose. Uh, second, the principle or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. And third, the statute must not foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. So if any government policy fails any one of those three parts, essentially it is unconstitutional. So it's a disjunctive test. Every single part has to be met in order for a law to be constitutional. We'll talk about uh, whether or not uh, the Dover policy violated this uh, test and actually what ways that it violated this test. In my opinion, the Dover policy did actually violate uh, the Lemon test. It clearly did not have a secular legislative purpose. But does that mean that as a general matter, it is therefore unconstitutional to teach intelligent design? Those are two different questions, but Judge Jones got them conf conflated and mixed them up in his ruling. So um, let's also focus really briefly a little bit more on that Edwards versus Aguilar test, uh, or case rather, from 1987. In this case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that creationism was unconstitutional. This started after the state of Louisiana had passed what was called a Balanced Treatment Act, requiring that no school is required to teach both evolution or creation science, but if one view is taught, then the other is taught. So if you teach one, you've got to teach the other. That's basically what the law said. I'm not saying I agree with this approach. I, I actually don't agree with these quote-unquote balanced treatment approaches. Uh, but in any case, the court found that the statute failed the Lemon Test because the actual legislative purpose, the court said, was to advance, quote, the religious belief that a supernatural creator was responsible for the creation of humankind. So this is interesting. Um, in the field of religion and the law, the case, is, the case law is often very murky. We don't often get bright line rules. Bright line means very clear legal tests. But here we have this very clear legal statement that essentially the belief that there is a supernatural creator is a religious belief and is unconstitutional to teach in public schools. So if you're claiming that there's some kind of a supernatural creator, then according to the Supreme Court, that is a religious belief that is unconstitutional to teach in public schools. And that's why the court held that creationism is unconstitutional. But they sort of showed very clearly that creationism involves the belief that there's a supernatural creator, and that's a religious belief. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have this statement in the Edwards case which said that it is, in fact, uh, legal to teach scientific critique of evolution. This is a, the full statement. They said, we do not imply that a legislature can never require that scientific critiques of prevailing scientific theories uh, be taught. Teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origins of humankind to school children might be validly done with the clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science instruction. So if you want to teach critiques of scientific theories like evolution, you want to teach uh, non-evolutionary views that are scientific, uh, that's okay, according to this statement in the Edwards ruling. Uh, okay, so let's get into the Dover case now. Um, what was the Dover policy? What did they adopt? Well, essentially, the Dover School Board required that an oral statement be read, this oral disclaimer, be read to students in their 10th grade biology classes before they learn about evolution. So this is the whole controversy. And the, the most controversial part of this short four-paragraph statement was this paragraph right here. It said, intelligent design is an explanation of the origin of life that differs from Darwin's view. The reference book of pandas and people is available for students who might be interested in gaining an understanding of what intelligent design actually involves. It was this short two-sentence statement that basically caused all of the controversy in the Dover case. Now, I don't personally recommend, and, and I think Discovery Institute would very much agree with this, we would not recommend that school boards use these kinds of disclaimers. Whether they're an oral disclaimer or a written disclaimer, they're not the best way to teach a subject. Um, and really, they don't do anything other than just you know, tell students something. Much better to actually show them you know, an idea if you want to talk about it. Now, we're going to talk about this further in detail in just a couple minutes, but Discovery Institute actually opposed Dover's ID policy. We not only opposed this idea to adopt a disclaimer, but we have long opposed a mandating intelligent design in public schools and pushing ID in the public school curricula, which is exactly what the Dover School Board did. Uh, before I came to Discovery Institute, some of my predecessors here had communication with the Dover School Board. They urged them not to adopt a policy that was going to involve intelligent design, and essentially Dover didn't listen to us. They rejected our policy advice, and they went with the advice of another group uh, which said, yeah, go ahead and do this. You'll have no trouble. Well, unfortunately, they did get into trouble. Um, 
So again, though, this is a very short statement that uh, shows, uh, you know, that it says intelligent design is an explanation for the origin of life that differs from Darwin's view. Some people have argued that this really does not amount to teaching intelligent design. And this is one of the places where actually I agreed with Judge Jones in the ruling. I mean, look, um, even if you're only mentioning it in a short, you know, four paragraph statement, uh, this amounts to teaching intelligent design. Now, whether or not intelligent design is a religious view that is unconstitutional, whether or not this statement here ought to be considered unconstitutional is a separate question. But I, at the very least, I agree with Judge Jones that this involves teaching ID. Uh, I don't think that this Dover School Board should have been teaching ID, but at the very least, they, are, uh, they were doing that. So uh, as I said, Discovery Institute opposed Dover's ID policy. In fact, um, very soon uh, uh, around the time of the adoption of Dover's policy, Discovery Institute issued a public statement. And this is what it said. It said, a recent news report seemed to suggest that the Center for Science and Culture endorses the adoption of textbook supplements teaching about the scientific theory of intelligent design, which simply holds that certain aspects of the universe and living things can be best explained as the result of an intelligent cause rather than material, merely material and frivolous processes like natural selection. Any such suggestion is incorrect. So, and this goes back to the conversations the Discovery Institute had, had behind the scenes with the Dover School Board leading up to their adoption of their ID policy. Um, Discovery Institute explicitly said to Dover, don't adopt a, a policy that requires the teaching of intelligent design. And it's important to understand why Discovery Institute takes this approach. It's not the case that somehow we think that ID is unconstitutional or that it's not science and therefore shouldn't be taught. No, we think ID is science. We think that ID should be considered constitutional to teach in public schools. The reason why Discovery Institute opposes pushing ID into public schools, and, and this was our policy before Dover, this is our policy after Dover, and this has been our policy since Dover. The reason we oppose mandating ID is because our priority with intelligent design is to see it grow and develop as a scientific theory. And we speculated pre-Dover that if ID got pushed into public schools, that would take the debate out of the scientific realm and push it into the political realm. And the politicization of teaching ID would result in increased persecution against pro-ID scientists and faculty at the university level. Okay, so we told Dover this, and they didn't listen to us. And this sort of turned out to be one of those times where you, uh, you turned out to be right, but you almost wish that you hadn't been. Because exactly what we pre would predicted would happen because of Dover mandating ID is what did happen, okay? So we predicted to them, look, if you guys mandate ID, it's going to politicize intelligent design, and it's actually going to result in more and more discrimination and persecution against pro-ID scientists at the universities. It's going to make it harder for them to make their case for ID to the scientific community. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. In the wake of the Dover case, we saw an intense spike in the level of persecution of pro-ID scientists and faculty. I can say this, part of my job at Discovery Institute over the last 10 years has been to uh, help to provide defense for these scientists and scholars, and in some cases students. Uh, and we saw a huge amount of persecution in the post-Dover era. And uh, unfortunately, you know, again, it's one of those times where your prediction turned out to be correct, but you almost wished that you hadn't been correct. Um, instead, what Discovery Institute has suggested for public schools is to simply teach the scientific evidence for and against Darwinian evolution without getting into alternative theories like intelligent design. And as I said, uh, this was our position before and over. Uh, there has been sort of this myth that's been put out there by the Darwin lobby that in the wake of the Dover trial, Discovery Institute changed its tune, or we evolved, as they love to say. They love this creationism evolves meme. And it's the idea that, you know, before Dover, we were trying to push ID into public schools, and then we evolved, and now we're not trying to do that. We're trying to promote critical analysis of evolution, or, or we changed the words to academic freedom. These are false, um, a, they're, they're anachronistic claims, because they do not fit what actually the historical chronology shows. Before the Dover case, we opposed pushing ID into public schools. And there's good examples of, of this on the public record. Uh, the D Darwin lobby's claim that we were trying to push ID into public schools is absolutely refuted by the, the public record. So for example, uh, here's a statement made by Stephen Meyer in 2002. It was in an op-ed he published in the Cincinnati Enquirer. This was when the Ohio State Board of Education was considering whether or not to require teachers to teach about scientific problems of evolution. It did not about intelligent design, but to cr critique evolution. 
And this was actually one of Discovery Institute's first major involvements in a major public policy battle. And what Dr. Meyer wrote is this. He said, recently while speaking to the Ohio State Board of Education, I suggested this approach as a way forward in Ohio in its increasingly contentious dispute about how to teach theories of biological origin and about whether or not to introduce the theory of intelligent design alongside Darwinism in the Ohio biology curriculum. And then he goes on to say, first, I suggested, speaking as an advocate of the theory of intelligent design, that Ohio not require students to know the scientific evidence and arguments for the theory of intelligent design, at least not yet. And then he goes on to say, instead, I proposed that Ohio teachers teach the scientific controversy about Darwinian evolution. Teachers should teach students about the main scientific arguments for and against Darwinian theory, and Ohio should test students for their understanding of those arguments and for their, no, sorry, not for their assent to a point of view. So what Dr. Meyer says here is essentially what our policy position has been on how to teach intelligent design and evolution since this time. And this is from 2002, you know, uh, over two years before Dover adopted its ID policy and three years plus before the Dover, policy, uh, the Dover uh, trial happened. Um, and so this was our position before the Dover case, to not mandate ID in public schools. So this sort of idea that the critical analysis is post-Dover is part of this evolution of creation narrative that really isn't true. It's not true. Um, and what's interesting is that Ohio actually did adopt the exact policy that Stephen Meyer was suggesting. And in their policy, they, rec they called for critical analysis of evolution, but they explicitly said in that policy that this does not call for the teaching of intelligent design or the testing of intelligent design. So Dover adopted the policy that we were looking at. I'm sorry, not, not Dover. Uh, Ohio adopted the policy that we were recommending, and they did not require the teaching of intelligent design. Dover, on the other hand, rejected this kind of advice that we gave. So uh, what happened in the, you know, the big picture of the Kitzmiller versus Dover case? Well, within about two months of Dover adopting its policy, the ACLU helped 11 parents of students in the Dover School District to file a suit against the Dover School Board. And about a year later, in the fall of 2005, the case went to trial. And the court found that Dover's policy failed the purpose prong of the Lemon Test and lacked a secular purpose because the school board members had made clear statements of religious motives. It also found that Dover's ID policy failed the effect prong of the Lemon Test because intelligent design was not science but a religious viewpoint. So this gets into that three-part Lemon Test. The first part says that a statute has to have a legislative purpose, and the court found that Dover's ID policy was not adopted because of a, le a secular legislative purpose. They had a religious purpose. And secondly, the court found that ID, uh, Dover's ID policy fa failed the effect prong, that every uh, government policy has to have a primary effect that neither advances nor inhibits religion. That's the, the second part of the Lemon Test. And they found that Dover's ID policy failed this part, this test, because it, uh, intelligent design was not science, but was a religious viewpoint. Now, what's interesting is that in the precedent of Edwards versus Aguilar, the US Supreme Court actually found that once you find evidence of religious motives, once you find that a law was enacted for the purpose of endorsing religion, you should not go on and continue your analysis and go into the effect analysis or the entanglement analysis, the third part of the Lemon Test. Essentially, once you, once you find that a law was enacted for the purpose of endorsing religion, you should stop. And this is a principle of the ju judicial economy, that we want courts to try to narrow the scope of their rulings and not go into complicated legal analyses of issues that don't have to be done in order to settle a case. And so again, this comes from the Edwards versus Aguilar case, and they said, if the law was enacted for the purpose of endorsing religion, no consideration of the second or third criteria of Lemon is necessary. Uh, Judge Jones didn't follow this precedent. He, after he found that Dover's ID policy had a religious purpose, he then went on to the second and third parts of the Lemon test, and he found that it failed the effect analysis. He found that the primary, per, uh, the primary effect of Dover's policy was to advance religion, and he found this because he went to a lengthy analysis of whether ID is science or religion, and then he found that Dover's ID policy resulted in excessive entanglement of government and religion. Uh, what jo Judge Jones should have done if he was following this precedent is he should have stopped his analysis after he found that the Dover School Board had a religious purpose behind their policy. And frankly, I think that there was good evidence that the Dover School Board did have 
religious motives when they pass their policy. Uh, one of the Dover School Board members made a statement to the effect of, somebody died 2,000 years ago, we've got to take a stand for him. That's a, 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 essentially a very close paraphrase of what he said. Uh, there was very clear evidence on the part of the Dover School Board that they had religious motives. Um, once Judge Jones found that, he should have stopped his analysis. And I think he would have on very strong grounds in his ruling in following legal precedent and also you know, not having his ruling overturned by a higher court. Instead, he didn't do that. Instead, he tried to go into a broad, sweeping analysis of whether idea science, and we'll talk about this more later, and he addressed lots of, lots of complicated questions which go far beyond the scope of what the judiciary is supposed to do, like whether evolution conflicts with religion, how do we define science, whether the type 3 secretory system could have been a, a precursor to the flagellum. He really engaged in what we would call judicial activism by trying to settle cases and or issues and controversies that were far outside the scope of, of the case that was before him uh, in that lawsuit. Okay, so do we want judges defining science? And here's a good example of why we don't want judges to go into these broad analyses that go beyond the scope of the judiciary. Uh, Judge Jones said in his ruling, he says, since ID is not science, the conclusion is inescapable that the only real effect of the ID policy is the advancement of religion. So, okay, what's, what's wrong with a statement? What's wrong with a statement? Well, anybody who's taken a basic course in philosophy of science knows that just because something is not science doesn't necessarily mean that it's religion. There are many things that are neither science nor religion. Uh, history, uh, may arguably be archaeology, philosophy, uh, psychology, um, maybe, you know, uh, breakfast cereals. None of this is science, but it's also not religion. So there are many things out there that are neither science nor religion. But Judge Jones sort of promoted this false dichotomy, this contrived dualism that he promoted in his ruling, which said that if ID is not science, then the conclusion is inescapable that the only real effect of the ID policy is the advancement of religion. Well, what if ID is something else? What if ID is philosophy? Or what if it's uh, you know, some form of, of uh, history? All of those things could be the case, in which case, just because ID is in science, doesn't therefore mean that it's religion. Now, of course, I would argue that ID is science, and we'll talk about this more in this discussion about why ID is science. But uh, I think that this is a good example of why we don't want judges defining science. They make poor philosophers of science. They make sort of these rookie errors, thinking that if something isn't science, that therefore it's religion. And of course, that's very poor philosophy of science, but unfortunately, that was canonized into law in Judge Jones's ruling. Um, here's the definition of science that Judge Jones gave. It's a six-part test that he applied to find that ID is not science. So again, this is a, a major reason why we don't want judges defining science. And we'll look at this de uh, definition of science that Judge Jones used in some detail, and we'll talk about how each of the six criteria in this uh, test for whether something is science were either irrelevant or he got his analysis wrong when he was analyzing whether ID is science. So number one, uh, Judge Jones says that ID violates the centuries-old ground rules of science by invoking and permitting supernatural causation. Uh, two, the argument of irreducible complexity central to ID employs the same flawed and illogical contrived dualism that doomed creation science in the 1980s. And three, ID's negative attacks on evolution have been refuted by the scientific community. And he went on to make three other criteria. He said, uh, this is number four, ID has failed to gain acceptance in the scientific community. Uh, number five, it has not generated peer-reviewed publications, nor six, has it been the subject of research and testing. We'll go through each of these and talk about, uh, first of all, whether they're even relevant to deciding whether ID is science, and then second, uh, whether or not Judge Jones' analysis on each of these six items was wrong. And we'll find that in each case, each criterion is either false or irrelevant or both to determining whether ID is science. So this was very poor analysis on Judge Jones's part. This is why we don't want judges going to these broad, sweeping analyses trying to define science. So A, ID in the supernatural. Well, Judge Jones said in his ruling that ID violates the centuries-old ground rules of science by invoking and permitting supernatural causation. Okay? And just in case you didn't get it, he said this in multiple other places. He said ID's religious nature is evident because it involves a supernatural designer. Uh, he even went further and said ID requires supernatural creation. I mean, he said ID requires supernatural creation. So is this true that ID requires supernatural creation? Well, I think there's lots of evidence that it does not, 
But as a first piece of evidence, let's look at the, pa at the pandas and people textbook that was referenced in Dover's oral disclaimer that was part of a big part of this case. That textbook actually says that scientists fail to distinguish between intelligence, which can be recognized by uniform sensory experience, and the supernatural, which cannot. So what is this textbook saying? What it's saying is that the supernatural cannot be recognized by the uniform sensory experience that's at the, heart, that's at the heart of science. So if science is appealing to the supernatural, what it's saying is that science cannot appeal to the supernatural. That our uniform sensory experience, the standard methods of science that we use, cannot get us to a conclusion about the supernatural. We'll see more examples of how the Pandas textbook said this in just a moment. So what the textbook said is that we can use science to infer intelligent causes, but we cannot use science to infer the supernatural. So obviously this textbook is promoting intelligent design, and if you read on in this textbook, it makes it very clear that we cannot, through the methods of science, infer that the intelligent cause responsible for life was a supernatural cause. And it actually says explicitly that science cannot study the supernatural. So I think the Dover textbook actually respects the so-called rule that Judge Jones says is that the ground rule of science that we cannot invoke the supernatural. Of course, that rule is also known as methodological naturalism. It's the idea that we can only invoke uh, naturalistic, non-supernatural causes when we are doing scientific investigation. Whether or not that rule is valid and whether or not that rule is a good rule for science, it's pretty clear that ID does not violate that rule and that the textbook, the ID textbook at the heart of this case, um, also did not violate methodological naturalism. It explicitly says we cannot study the supernatural through science. Uh, let's look at another example where the Dover textbook says this. It says, appeals to intelligent design may be considered in science, as illustrated by current NASA search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. Archaeology has pioneered the development of methods for distinguishing the effects of natural and intelligent causes. We should recognize, however, that if we go further and conclude that the intelligence responsible for biological origins is outside the universe, supernatural, or within it, we do so without the help of science. So what this quote from the Pandas textbook is saying is that intelligent design only appeals to an intelligent cause. And if we go further and conclude that that intelligence is supernatural or natural, we're going beyond what we can learn through science. And so as a result, the Pandas textbook, and this is consistent with what ID proponents have been saying in pretty much all of their major writings for a long time, all intelligent design as a theory appeals to is an intelligent cause. We don't go beyond that and try to determine whether or not that cause is supernatural or natural, because that goes beyond what we can learn through a scientific investigation. Um, now, Judge Jones ignored these quotes from the Pandas textbook, but he did actually quote the Pandas textbook in one place. Uh, here's what he said. He said, an explicit concession that the intelligent designer works outside the laws of nature and science and a direct reference to religion is Pandas rhetorical statement what kind of intelligent agent was it, the designer? In answer, on its own, science cannot answer this question. It must leave it to religion and philosophy. Now, it turns out that there's actually a much uh, longer part of this quote that Judge Jones ignored. So let's look at the full quote from Pandas, the actual quote, to see what the textbook is really saying. Is the textbook really saying that, we are, that we're going to invoke religion, we're going to say that the designer is supernatural, and that it's not a natural cause? Uh, what does the textbooks actually say? Here's the full quote that Judge Jones didn't give in the ruling. The actual quote says, if science is based upon experience, then science tells us the message encoded in DNA must have originated from an intelligent cause. But what kind of an intelligent agent was it? On its own, science cannot answer this question. It must leave it to religion and philosophy. But that should not prevent science from acknowledging evidences for an intelligent cause origin wherever they may exist. So rather than invoking religion and saying that the intelligent cause is supernatural, Pandas quite explicitly leaves it at just an intelligent cause. That is as far as the Pandas textbook goes when it talks about what, you know, the nature of the designer. It says that there is an intelligent cause. And it explicitly doesn't get into the question of whether or not that designer is natural or supernatural. So yeah, religion and philosophy will have to answer that question, but the Pandas textbook isn't trying to answer that question. It's not trying to get into religion and philosophy. All the Pandas textbook does is invoke and infer an intelligent cause. And it says, look, science can detect an intelligent cause wherever they may exist. 
But that's all it can do. And as we saw in the other quotes, it says, if you go further and, and appeal to a supernatural intelligence or a natural one, now you're going beyond what the, the data from biology can tell us. And you know, this is not some kind of a uh, strategy, a legal strategy, or we're not being coy here. Think about the way intelligent design works. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that the information that encodes the bacterial flagellum uh, in the DNA, that points to an intelligent cause. Okay, we have this digital language-based code that's encoding a, an irreducibly complex rotary engine. I mean, that's a great argument for an intelligent designer that's needed to produce that information. But that information in the DNA, it doesn't say made by Yahweh, or made by Allah, or made by Buddha, or made by Yoda, or made by whoever you think the designer is. All that information is, is it's a language-based digital code that encodes a, an irreducibly complex molecular machine, a rotary engine. That's a great argument for an intelligent cause that's needed, but if you go further and try to say, okay, well, the intelligent cause that made this information in this machine um, is, you know, the supernatural god of the Bible, or it's, you know, Zortan from planet Xenu, if you're saying that, you're going beyond what we can learn through a scientific investigation. So intelligent design tries to respect the limits of science. It tries to not go beyond what we can learn from the scientific evidence alone. And all the data is here is a digital-based language, uh, co language based code in the DNA in a molecular machine. That information alone is only enough to tell us that there was an intelligent cause origin. And just like Panda said, if we go beyond that and say that, okay, this designer here that made this was supernatural or natural, we're going beyond what we can learn through the scientific evidence. So as a result, intelligent design, out of a desire to respect the limits of science, doesn't get into those larger religious questions about who the designer was. It limits its conclusions to an intelligent cause. And of course, ID theorists, by and large, are very open about who they believe the designer is or what their own personal religious beliefs are about the designer. Uh, we'll see in just a moment that Michael Behe was very open even during the Dover trial, that he believes the designer is God. But he makes it clear that that's his own personal religious belief, not a conclusion of intelligent design. So the point here is the Pandas textbook nowhere attempts to answer the question of who the designer is. So when Judge Jones claims that Pandas statement is trying to actually invoke religion to appeal to a supernatural creator, he's simply putting words in Panda's mouth that it doesn't state. And Judge Jones' uh, misquote of Panda's is quite bad. If he had quoted the actual quotes from Panda's, it would have been very clear that Panda's nowhere attempts to address or answer the question of what is the identity of the designer, is the designer supernatural or not. It does not try to address those questions. Um, instead, what Judge Jones did to try to uh, claim that Pandas was really creationism in disguise is he looked at these pre-publication drafts of Pandas. Now these were uh, drafts of this textbook that had been written in the early to mid-1980s, some 20 years before the Dover case even came about. Nobody even knew that these drafts existed. But Judge Jones said that somehow these drafts that had been locked up in you know, bankers' boxes for 20 years that nobody had ever seen, that somehow they would have showed uh, a reasonable observer in the Dover School District that ID is creationism. And the, the claim that was made was that the early drafts of the Pandas textbook used creationist terminology. And that after the Edwards versus Aguilar ruling that struck down creationism, they changed the terminology and started using intelligent design terminology out of a legal strategy to evade this ruling. That was sort of the, the narrative that was being told. Well, what's interesting is that when we look at the pre-publication drafts of Pandas, yes, sometimes they did use creation-type terminology, but when they used that terminology, they used it in a different way from the way that creationists used that terminology. As a matter of fact, they would say things that made it explicitly clear that they were not getting into religious questions about the supernatural. Uh, let me give you an example from a pre-publication draft of Pandas. Uh, here's a quote. It says, this is not merely the design or clockmaker argument of William Paley, which was long ago abandoned by scientists. There are two important differences. First, Paley's argument was to extrapolate to the supernatural from the clock. The problem was that biology provided no examples of the supernatural manipulating the material, and thus there was no basis in uniform experience for going from nature to the supernatural, from inferring an unobserved supernatural cause from an observed effect, okay? So what is this saying? What it's saying is actually very consistent with the published version of the Pandas textbook. What it's saying is that we cannot go 
from you know, simple biological data, you know, information in DNA, et, so, et cetera, et cetera. We can't go from that to the supernatural because we don't have any experience with the supernatural manipulating the material. All we can infer is an intelligent cause. So when Pandas uses the term intelligent design, or when it, the argument it's making, I'm sorry, when Pandas uses this sort of creation terminology, the argument it's making is clearly different from creationism, where creationism always appeals to a supernatural creator. Here's another interesting quote. I'll read the quote in the red box at the bottom of the slide. It says, some master, and I'll read the whole slide. Uh, the second difference is that unlike Paley's day, we have scientific tools and terminology to distinguish between order and information and to quantify the latter, whether encountered on the pages of a book, in the face of a mountain, or in biology. Thus, from the observation that human intelligence can communicate by manipulating sequences of alphabetic letters, creationists infer that a similar kind of intelligence was responsible for the message sequence of nucleotide letters in DNA. Some master intellect is the creator of life, but such observable instances of information cannot tell us if the intellect behind them is natural or supernatural. This is not a question science can answer. So this is a great example of what we're talking about here. This is a pre-publication draft that uses this creationist terminology, uh, saying creationists infer that similar kind of intelligence was involved, and talking about a creator of life. Okay? But then it goes on to say that the information in life, quote, cannot tell us if the intellect behind them is natural or supernatural. That's very different from what you would have been hearing creationists saying back in the 1980s. Creationists always appeal to the supernatural. And in fact, this is why in the Edwards versus Aguilard ruling, which happened in 1987, the US Supreme Court found that a supernatural creator is a religious view, and that creationism is unconstitutional because it postulates a supernatural creator. Um, creationism always postulates some kind of a supernatural creator, yet here we have creationist terminology being used alongside the claim that we cannot tell if the intellect behind life is natural or supernatural. This is not a question that science can answer. So the substance of what these pre-publication drafts of Pandas is saying is very different from the typical thing you would hear a creationist say. In fact, it's different in a way that is legally important because it shows that ID is really lacking this very quality of, of appealing to a supernatural creator that caused creationism to be declared unconstitutional. Uh, let's look at one more quote from a, from a pre-publication draft. It says, the point of clarification to be made is this. We can know from uniform sensory experience, and thus from science, about the material world. But there are two things about which we cannot learn through uniform sensory experience. One is the supernatural, and so to teach it in science classes would be out of place. The other thing we cannot learn through uniform sensory experience is that there is no supernatural, i.e. that natural causes identified through sensory experience exhaust reality. We cannot detect evidence for philosophical naturalism. To teach either of these two, even by the presumption of excluding the other, is to yield the classroom to apologetics, either the apologetics of theism or the apologetics of philosophical naturalism. Thus, science can identify an intellect, but is powerless to tell, tell us if that intellect is within the universe or beyond it. So Judge Jones ignored all of these quotes from the pre-publication drafts of Pandas. If he had quoted these, it would have been very clear that even these pre-publication drafts made it clear that the textbook was not getting into the fundamental question of whether there is a supernatural or not. Uh, the, the, the basic project that Pandas had in mind was fundamentally different from the creationist project that was so common in the 1980s. And so I think this is very significant. Judge Jones claimed that these, this creationist terminology showed that Pandas was actually trying to uh, promote creationism, and they changed the terminology to hide it. But the reality is the terminology was not changed because they were trying to hide what, where, what they were doing was creationism. No, it's because what they were doing was substantively different from creationism, and they needed new terminology to make that clear. And if you want to understand you know, where, how we can see that, look no further than the deposition testimony of Charles Thaxton. He was the academic editor for the Pandas and People textbook. He's a chemist. He was involved in the writing of, these, of the Pandas textbook, and he was involved in the creation of these pre-publication drafts of Pandas back in the 1980s. Uh, he wasn't called to testify during the actual Dover trial, but he was deposed by uh, the ACLU's attorneys before the case. Here's what he said. He said, and he was asked, you know, why did you guys change the terminology 
in the pre-publication drafts from creationist terminology to intelligent design terminology. And here's what he said. He said, I wasn't comfortable with the typical vocabulary that for the most part creationists were using because it didn't express what I was trying to do. They were wanting to bring God into the discussion and I was wanting to stay within the empirical domain and do what you can legitimately do there. So what Dr. Thaxton is saying here is creationism was doing something he didn't want to do. They were always getting into God and the supernatural and religion and he wanted to construct a strictly scientific, a strictly empirically based argument for design without getting in all, into all that religious baggage. And so he wasn't comfortable, he says, with the typical vocabulary that creationists were using. He wanted to find new terminology. And you can look at what uh, Thaxton has said elsewhere. We actually have a great podcast with uh, Dr. Thaxton where he talks about that he learned of the term intelligent design from a NASA engineer that he heard talking and he thought, that's the kind of language I need. I need new language to distinguish my project from the creationist project. So then, of course, the, so, so Panda's terminology was changed not to hide the fact that ID is creationism because ID isn't creationism. It was to make it clear that ID is different from creationism. So the question often comes up, you know, why was Panda's using this creationist terminology to begin with if its project was different from creationism? Well, think about it. This book was written in the early 80s originally. And you know, all these drafts of this textbook were being written in the early to mid 1980s. At this time, creationism was sort of the only game in town when it came to non-evolutionary views. It was the only thing that existed. And so that was the terminology that everybody knew about. And so when they started to write this book, they sort of just naturally adopted the terminology that was out there in the culture. It was in the air at the time. But as they got going with their project, they realized, you know what? What we're doing is actually different from creationism. Creationism, well, let's go back to the, the Thaxton quote. Creationism is always trying to bring God and the supernatural into the, the discussion. And what they decided they wanted to do something different to stay within the empirical domain and to not get into this religious stuff. And so they realized that they needed a new terminology, new vocabulary to distinguish their project from creationism. That is why the terminology was changed in the pre-publication drafts. And you can see that even in the pre-Edwards versus Aguilar drafts, that even pre-Edwards, before the Supreme Court struck down creationism, they already were saying, look, you can't get to the supernatural from science alone. So that alone shows that what they were doing was different from what caused creationism to be struck down in the Edwards case for postulating a supernatural creator. So uh, Judge Jones had clear evidence in, his, uh, in the, the trial record that ID does not require or invoke uh, supernatural creation. And in fact, uh, Scott Minnick, one of the pro-ID uh, scientists, he's a pro-ID microbiologist, he testified during the Dover trial. He was asked, do you have an opinion as to whether intelligent design requires the action of a supernatural creator? He said, I do. Uh, what is that opinion? It does not. Uh, Michael, Michael Behe wrote in a, uh, doc, in a paper that we cited to him in one of our amicus briefs. He says, as regards the identity of the designer, modern ID theory happily echoes Isaac Newton's phrase, hypothesis non fingo. And of course, hypothesis non fingo means I don't make any hypothesis. I don't feign any hypothesis. It's sort of like saying, look, I'm not trying to make a hypothesis about something that science cannot address. So IE does not address the identity of the designer. Uh, B he testified very much the same during the Dover trial. He was asked, so is it accurate for people to claim or to represent that intelligent design holds that the designer was God? B he says, no, that is completely inaccurate. Okay, he's asked, well, people have asked you your opinion as to who you believe the designer is. Is that correct? B answers, that is right. Has, and then he's asked, has science answered that question? And he answers, no, science has not done so. And he's asked, and I believe that you have answered on occasion that you believe the designer is God. Is that correct? And B, he says, yes, that's correct. Uh, and then he asks, are you making a scientific claim of that answer? And he says, no, I conclude that based on theological and philosophical and historical factors. So ID proponents, this is very consistent with how we ID proponents have addressed the question of the identity of the designer. Uh, Michael Behe in this testimony is very clear. Yes, he says, I do believe the designer is God, uh, but he's making it also clear that he's not saying that that's a scientific claim, that he concludes that based upon theology, philosophy, history, and other fields that are outside the realm of science. So intelligent design as a scientific theory does not try to address the identity of the designer. 
it only appeals to, appeals to an intelligent cause. Many ID proponents might have their own views about who the designer is, but that's their own personal religious beliefs. Um, they don't conclude that based upon the theory of intelligent design. And in fact, intelligent design includes people who are not religious. There are non-religious ID proponents. So how could ID have some kind of a you know, claim about the identity of the designer if its proponents don't have an agreement on who the designer is? There are ID proponents who don't even believe in God. So uh, to me, that shows you that ID cannot postulate that there is a divine supernatural creator um, if there is no uh, consensus among ID proponents about who the designer is. Okay, so going back to Edwards. Um, in the Edwards versus Aguilar ruling, it said, the key rule from Edwards, the idea that a supernatural creator um, was responsible for the creation of humankind is a religious belief. That is the key rule from Edwards. Supernatural creator is a religious belief. But does ID require supernatural causation? Well, according to the testimony given to him, Judge Jones, in this case, it does not. Uh, both the pro-ID expert witnesses, Michael Behe and Scott Minnick, said no, ID does not require supernatural causation. Uh, other documents that were quoted to Judge Jones made that very clear. Unfortunately, Judge Jones uh, misrepresented intelligent design in the ruling, and he just ignored what pro-ID expert witnesses testified before him in his own courtroom. He did this so he could force, or try to force at least, the square peg of intelligent design into the round hole of creationism. Uh, but the reality is that ID lacks this key quality that caused creationism to be declared religion by the US Supreme Court in Edwards versus Aguilar. ID only appeals to an intelligent cause. It tries to res respect the limits of science, so it doesn't address whether that cause is natural or supernatural. And as a result, ID lacks this key characteristic of appealing to a supernatural creator that caused creationism to be struck down as a religious view. And so I, you cannot fit this square peg of intelligent design into the round hole of creationism. Again, ID lacks the key characteristic that caused creationism to be declared unconstitutional, and Judge Jones basically uh, ignored the definition of intelligent design given by pro-ID expert witnesses in his courtroom, and he misdefined intelligent design in his ruling. Okay, let's look at a couple other uh, issues that Judge Jones got wrong here. Um, you know, perhaps we can debate whether or not uh, ID involves a supernatural creator. I think the evidence is pretty clear that it doesn't. But it should be a pretty black and white question about whether or not ID proponents have generated peer-reviewed pro-ID publications. Uh, Judge Jones says ID has not generated peer-reviewed publications. In a case he didn't get that, once again, he said in, I think, five other places, ID is not science. It cannot be adjudged a valid accepted scientific theory as it has failed to publish in peer-reviewed journals in addition to failing to produce papers in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, the evidence presented in this case demonstrates that ID is not supported by any peer-reviewed research data or publications. A final indicator of how ID has failed to demonstrate scientific warrant is the complete absence of peer-reviewed publications supporting the theory. So in no fewer than five places in his ruling, Judge Jones said that ID has not published any peer-reviewed publications. Is that true? What does the record say in his case? Well, first of all, uh, Michael Behe testified about his own paper in the journal Protein Science, where he basically was putting forth a test of the evolvability of protein-protein interactions. And Behe testified that this paper is supportive of ID concepts. Um, Scott Minnick testified that there are between seven and 10 peer-reviewed papers supporting intelligent design. Even Barbara Forrest, an anti-ID expert witness, testified about a paper by Stephen Meyer, which was published in a uh, mainstream biology journal that explicitly argues for intelligent design. So this paper was published in 2004, the year before the Dover trial. So I don't know how Judge Jones said that ID had a complete absence of peer-reviewed publications. Um, we documented some of these papers to Judge Jones, some of these peer-reviewed publications that support intelligent design. We documented these in our amicus brief. So we know that Judge Jones was aware of these papers. I can only assume that Judge Jones must be a magician, because he's capable, he's able to take these peer-reviewed publications and make them disappear, uh, as if they didn't exist. But they do exist, despite Judge Jones's uh, adamant suggestions to the controversy in five different places in the ruling. Uh, what about testing and research? Has ID been the subject of testing and research? Judge Jones claims that it has not been the subject of testing and research, uh, but uh, that is not true. Before we get into this, though, I want to make it clear. Um, the US Supreme Court has said that publication in a peer-reviewed paper is not 
a sine qua non of admissibility. It does not necessarily correlate with the reliability. So even though IID has published peer-reviewed papers, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, peer review is not a necessary condition of being good science. So even though IID has published peer-reviewed papers, you don't have to have that, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, in order to have good science. And this is coming from a 1993 ruling, uh, Dauber versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. Um, but uh, regarding uh, research and testing, again, Judge Jones had testimony in his own courtroom from one of the pro-ID expert witnesses, Scott Minnick, about his own research that he's done on intelligent design. Uh, Scott Minnick was asked, he said, do you employ principles and concepts from intelligent design in your work? He said, I do. And, he was said, and then he was asked, I'd like for you to explain that further. I know you've prepared several slides to do that. And Scott Minnick says, uh, he talks about his own genetic knockout experiments on the bacterial flagellum, which show that it is irreducibly complex. We'll talk about these more in a few minutes. But he said, a one mutation, one part knockout. It can't swim. Put that single gene back in, we restore motility. Same thing over here. We knock out one part, put a good copy of the gene back in, and they can swim. By definition, the system is irreducibly complex. We've done that with all 35 components of the flagellum, and we get the same effect. So Scott Minnick sat in the courtroom before Judge Jones. He testified about his own research from his own lab that he runs at the University of Idaho, um, where he studies the flagellum. He testified about his own research he's done, genetic knockout experiments, which show that it's irreducibly complex. And then Judge Jones rules there's been no research or testing on intelligent design. I don't know how Judge Jones got that. Maybe he just wasn't uh, paying attention when, Mike, when Scott Minnick said this. I don't know. But we also documented some other examples of testing and research to Judge Jones uh, in some of the amicus briefs. We documented two papers by Douglas Axe, published in the Journal of Molecular Biology, where basically Douglas Axe did mutational sensitivity tests on proteins and found that they are rich in specified complexity. Basically, he found that uh, functional protein folds are very, very, very unlikely when you look at all the possible amino acid sequences. And this is high levels of complex and specified information in biology. We also uh, documented him another, another paper by Scott Minnick and Steve Meyer, where they did research on the bacterial flagellum and talked about whether or not the bacterial flagellum could have evolved. And this research, of course, is ongoing. Uh, Biologic Institute is doing research looking at the evolvability of proteins, testing the prediction of, of intelligent design, asking whether or not biological systems are rich in complex and specified information. Um, they're also looking at uh, fine tuning in the universe, looking at new layers of fine tuning uh, and new parameters that are required for life in our universe. So there's lots of ID research that is ongoing. And in fact, in 2011, the ID research community uh, it struck a milestone and then it published its 50th peer-reviewed scientific paper. We're now up to about 80 peer-reviewed publications from ID proponents. And for those non-math majors who are watching this, 50 is greater than zero. Okay, So Judge Jones said there is zero. It wasn't true then. It's certainly not true now. And if you want a, a very exhaustive listing of many of the peer-reviewed papers supporting ID, you can go to this URL here, uh, discovery.org slash ID slash peer dash review. And we've got a, a pretty exhaustive listing of many of the peer-reviewed publications. And you can see that quite a few are pre-dover. Um, there's, there's, there's a bunch post-dover as well. Uh, but the reality is that Judge Jones was simply flat wrong to claim that ID has not published peer-reviewed papers or that has not been doing uh, research and testing on intelligent design. Um, OK, let's look at another problem that Judge Jones got in his ruling when he defined intelligent design as a strictly negative argument against evolution. He basically denied that there is a positive case for design. Uh, this is what Judge Jones said. He said, ID employs the same flawed and illogical contrived dualism that doomed creation science in the 1980s. ID proponents primarily argue for design through negative arguments against evolution. Okay, So what he's saying is that this is argument. And he goes back to, I guess, back in the 1980s, I guess if you were paying attention, the creationists were saying that, OK, because evolution is wrong, therefore creationism is right. Okay, now, I'm not even a young earth creationist, so I don't even agree that they're right. But the problem with that argument is that you don't have evidence for one theory simply because you find evidence for another. Um, every good scientist knows that evidence against one theory is not, therefore, in and of itself, arguments for another. And so, of course, just because maybe you uh, find that you know, some structure cannot evolve 
That doesn't mean that the Earth is 10,000 years old. Okay, fine. So the creationists were using some bad logic back in the 1980s. Okay, but he, he tries to say that a that logic somehow makes creationism unscientific and religion, and b that ID uses that same logic. That ID primarily argues for design through negative arguments against evolution. Well, is it even true that ID uses this logic? Well, if you go back to the Dover testimony, look at Scott Minnick's testimony, and he explicitly uh, testified about the positive argument for design. And he actually makes a very nice, eloquent statement of the positive argument for design. Here's what he says. He says the positive argument is that we know when we find irreducibly compl complex systems or information storage and processing systems from our own experience of cause and effect that there is an intelligence associated with it. And so it is logical to assume when we find these systems in a cell, if we can, if the flagellum is irreducibly complex, then yes, there's an intelligence behind it. That's a uniformitarian deduction from cause and effect that we know from our everyday experience. So this is a very nice statement that the positive argument for design is that whenever we know of the origin of an irreducibly complex system or some information storage and processing system, in all of our experience with cause and effect, there's always an intelligence associated with the origin of that system. And so when we find these very kinds of systems in the cell, irreducibly complex molecular machines, information storage in our DNA, or information processing to convert the information in proteins to, uh, pro I'm sorry, the information in DNA to proteins, when we find these kinds of systems in a cell, we are justified in inferring that there was an intelligent cause responsible for them. Um, here's another nice statement from a uh, paper that was published by Scott Minnick and Steve Meyer in a scientific uh, conference proceedings, and we documented this statement to Judge Jones. It says, in all irreducibly complex systems in which the cause of the system is known by experience or observation, intelligent design or engineering played a role in the origin of the system. Although some may argue this is merely an argument from ignorance, we regard it as an inference to the best explanation given what we know about the powers of intelligence as opposed to strictly natural or material causes. So here they're making a positive argument that in all of our experience with the origin of irreducibly complex systems, they come from an intelligence. And so when we find these systems in the cell, we're justified in inferring an intelligent cause was involved in their origin. So this is not strictly a negative argument against evolution. It's a positive argument for design, based upon finding in nature the kind of information and complexity which in our experience always comes from intelligence. And these were documented to Judge Jones, and he just ignored this testimony. Uh, here's another piece of testimony that, doc that Judge Jones ignored uh, from Michael Behe. Michael Behe testified, this argument for design is an entirely positive argument. This is how we recognize design, by the purposeful arrangement of parts. Now this is sort of a very rudimentary positive argument, but it's a nice summation of the positive argument for design. Whenever we find a purposeful arrangement of parts, that always indicates an intelligent design was behind it. In our experience, that always comes from intelligence. So again, uh, Judge Jones just ignored the way that ID proponents defined their own theory. That they, he ignored the way that they offered this positive argument for design, and instead he claimed that ID is simply a negative argument against evolution, that we argue for design simply by negating evolution, and that's simply not how ID works. So again, the bottom line is that Judge Jones defined ID as a strictly negative argument against evolution that appeals to the supernatural. But ID is neither of those two things. So it's much easier to refute a position when you misconstrue it, right? But I would say that good scholarship lets somebody stake out their own position, and then you critique it, okay? If it fails, fine. If it doesn't fail, okay, we'll look at it. What Judge Jones didn't do is he didn't let ID proponents define their own position. Instead, he adopted this uh, false, contrived, and inaccurate straw man version of ID that was promoted by ID's critics. And he struck down that false version, that inaccurate, that straw man version of intelligent design, rather than the actual version of intelligent design that was put forth by ID proponents in his own courtroom during the trial. So this is not just bad law and bad science. I would say most of all, it's actually bad scholarship. Because when you're critiquing a viewpoint, again, you should always let your opponent stake out their own position. Then you critique their actual position. Judge Jones did not do that. He critiqued a straw man, false version of intelligent design. And of course, this was the version of intelligent design that was being put forth by Ken Miller 
and other ID critics who misrepresented intelligence design, as they often do, uh, during the Dover trial. So uh, now we do, we've looked at some of the errors in the Dover ruling. Let's look at what I call the Kitzmiller versus Dover double standard. That uh, Judge Jones adopted a double standard when he looked at the religious implications or the religious associations of ID versus Darwinian evolution. So essentially, the way he framed his ruling is that religious or anti-religious implications, they always count ID against ID, but not against Darwinism. Or religious or anti-religious beliefs of ID proponents, they count against ID, but not against Darwinism. Or religious or anti-religious motives count against ID, but not against Darwinian evolution. So we had to ask the question, is Darwinian evolution religiously neutral? What would happen if Judge Jones were to apply these tests fairly to Darwinian evolution? Well, Richard Dawkins, of course, happens to be the world's most famous evolutionary biologist and also the world's most famous atheist. Is that just a coincidence? He once said that Darwin made it possible to become an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Now, I'm certainly not saying that everybody out there who believes in Darwinian evolution is an atheist, but it's a reality that many people draw anti-religious implications from Darwinian evolution. Richard Dawkins and many other people have made quotes of the same effect. So if we're going to say that the fact that ID has larger implications that might touch upon religion, that that somehow disqualifies ID from being science, then we have to ask, how will that influence evolution being taught in public schools when we see also similar anti-religious implications coming from Darwinian evolution? Uh, even uh, Ken Miller, who himself claims to be a theistic evolutionist, he he won, uh, five editions of his, his textbook say that evolution works without either plan or purpose. Evolution is random and undirected. Now, I think that's very clearly sort of an unfriendly implication that evolution has towards religion. So if we're going to treat these implications against evolution in the same way that Judge Jones treated the implications of ID against that theory, that might threaten the teachability of evolution in public schools. Um, Ken Miller, uh, one of his other textbooks, says Darwin knew that accepting this theory required believing in philosophical materialism, the conviction that matter is the stuff of all existence and that all mental and spiritual phenomena are its byproducts. Uh, once again, these are very strong philosophical implications that are being taken from Darwinian evolution. And I think that if Judge Jones were to treat Darwinian evolution the same way that he treated ID, then you would have to find that Darwinian evolution is unconstitutional. Now, of course, from my perspective, evolution should be taught without some of this philosophical baggage. We shouldn't have statements in textbooks that believing, accepting evolution requires believing in philosophical materialism. We should teach evolution as a science. And I think when you do that, you can teach it without having to worry about these religious implications uh, disqualifying it from being science. But the same is also true for intelligent design. And I actually think the Pandas and People textbook did a half decent job of teaching ID strictly as a science. It says, look, this is the evidence for intelligent design. Information in DNA, molecular machinery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then when it comes to the larger implications, the textbook says, look, if we're going to get into the supernatural versus the natural, that's going beyond science. So we're not going to get into that. We're going to just simply infer an intelligent cause using the methods of science, and we're going to leave it at that. So I think ID, did, the, the textbook actually did a decent job of doing it right, whereas some of the very textbooks from uh, the uh, anti-ID expert witness in the case um, do a very poor job of mixing up the implications with trying to teach science. What about religious beliefs? You know, there's one point in the Dover ruling where Judge Jones actually said that another piece of evidence that ID is religion is the fact that uh, both Michael Behe and Scott Minnick believe the designer is God. That's not an exact quote, but that's a pretty darn close quote to what he said. To me, that just turns the First Amendment on its head. What happened to freedom of religion? Where a scientist can be judged on his, you know, he's not going to have his personal religious beliefs become part of the judgment of his personal scientific beliefs. A person's scientific beliefs can be judged on whether they're right or wrong, not based upon, you know, what their religious beliefs are. But, okay, so Judge Jones should never have said that the fact that Michael Behe and Scott Minnick believe the designer is God somehow causes ID to be religion. Because again, those are their personal religious beliefs. Those are not conclusions of ID. But if he wants to play that game of looking at the personal religious beliefs of, of the proponents of an idea, let's look at what some of the plaintiff's expert witnesses believed. 
Um, one of the plaintiff's experts' uh, witnesses, Barbara Forrest, sits on the board of directors of the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association. And she's very much an atheist advocate. She's not just an atheist, she's an atheist activist. So, uh, and she's written papers defending philosophical naturalism, basically defending atheism. Uh, Eugenie Scott, who was in the courtroom as well for a lot of the trial, she was helping to advise the ACLU attorneys who were trying to get ID banned. She was also the longtime executive, executive director at that time to the National Center for Science Education, one of the leading anti-ID activist groups in the country that again helped to advise the Dover plaintiffs. And according to Nature, Dr. Scott is one of the nation's most high-profile Darwinists. Okay? Well, she is a signer of the Third Humanist Manifesto, which aspires to create a world, quote, without supernaturalism, because we, quote, are the result of unguided evolutionary change, and nature is, quote, self-existing. So Eugenie Scott is, again, a, a very much an avowed atheist, an atheist activist. She, want, she signed this Third Humanist Manifesto, which is an aggressive statement of the atheist agenda to impose sort of their anti-supernatural beliefs on the world. And yet, somehow, Judge Jones didn't matter to him that leading proponents of evolution, even expert witnesses against intelligent design, had these atheistic beliefs and atheistic agendas. Now, do I think that Barbara Forrest or Eugenie Scott don't have the right to have these beliefs? Or do I think that their personal religious or anti-religious beliefs ought to count against their, against their scientific views? Absolutely not. I think they absolutely should have every right to hold these beliefs. Uh, if they want to be atheists, that's fine. If they want to go out into the public square or privately and talk about their atheism, promote atheism, sign humanist manifestos, be on the board of directors of secular humanist groups, that's all fine. They should be able to do all that. And when we look at evolution, we should not be judging evolution based upon the personal anti-religious beliefs of its leading proponents. Evolution either stands or falls because it's a good scientific theory or not a good scientific theory. Um, the fact that some proponents of a, of a theory might have certain religious or anti-religious beliefs is a separate question from whether that theory is science and whether it's a good scientific theory. Okay? So uh, Judge Jones really went into an analysis that was irrelevant to understanding whether idea is science. But we have to ask the question, if Judge Jones wants to scrutinize the personal beliefs and motives of ID proponents, what would happen if that same logic was applied to Darwinian evolution? I think that if you were to apply that logic fairly, pretty quickly, you would have to see Darwinian evolution being struck down as unconstitutional in public schools. Now, I don't want that. Judge Jones doesn't want that. And certainly the Darwin lobby doesn't want that. So what we need to do is sort of throw out these contrived, fallacious legal tests that look at the personal religious beliefs and motives of the proponents of a theory or look at the larger implications of a theory that go beyond the science. We have to just look at the content of a theory and ask, is it a scientific theory and is it a good one if we want to find out you know, if it should be taught in public schools. Uh, Judge Jones unfortunately applied this double standard where he looked at the larger religious beliefs and motives and implications of intelligent design, but he ignored how that might uh, even strike down the theory of evolution if that same logic were to be applied fairly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Judge Jones' Judge Jones's judicial activism. Uh, this to me is one of the most uh, kind of amusing parts of the ruling. He made this bizarre statement in the Kitzmiller versus Dober case. I've never seen anything like this in any, any ruling. It's sort of a preemptive strike against people who would say that his ruling was activist. And he said, those who disagree with our holding will likely mark it as the product of an activist judge. If so, they will have erred, as this is manifestly not an activist quote, qu court. Uh, what a bizarre statement that he's trying to tell people, look, we're not an activist court. I'm not an activist court. Well, Judge Jones, methinks thou doth protest too much. Uh, this is one of the weirdest remarks I've ever seen in a ruling. And why are you so worried about people thinking you're an activist judge? Well, maybe it's because Judge Jones went way beyond the normal scope of the judiciary in his ruling. Okay. So again, uh, let's look at some ways that Judge Jones did this. Review, let's review the Lemon Test very briefly. Uh, the Lemon Test that says that, first of all, a statute must have a secular legislative purpose. And second, the principle or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. So according to Edwards versus Aguilard, if the law was enacted for the purpose of endorsing religion, then no consideration of the third, second or third criteria of Lemon is necessary. Okay? So essentially, if you find a religious purpose, 
you do not need to look at the effect of the law and ask whether or not its primary effect is to advance religion. So under this principle from Edwards, Judge Jones should have stopped his analysis and his ruling as soon as he found that the Dover School Board acted under religious motives. And as I said earlier, I think he had very clear evidence of religious motives from the Dover School Board. But Judge Jones didn't do that. Instead, he engaged in very sweeping questions in his effect analysis under the effect prong of the Lemon Test, where he tried to rule on expansive social, scientific, and even religious questions that are unnecessary or irrelevant even to his case. Some of these questions include, how do we define science? Is ID science? Could the type 3 secretory system form a precursor to the bacterial flagellum? Is the blood clotting cascade irreducibly complex? Can evolutionary processes produce new information? Or does evolution conflict with religion? Um, each of these questions were unnecessary for Judge Jones in, in this case. All he needed to do was to find clear evidence of religious motives from the Dover School Board, which he did, and that should have been the end of his case under the precedent of Edwards versus Aguilar. And by the way, I mean, Judge Jones cited Edwards versus Aguilar as an authority all over his ruling, except in this particular case, he ignored that precedent when it instructed him to stop his analysis after finding religious motives. Uh, so again, Judge Jones said, those who disagree with our holding will likely mark it as the product of an activist judge. If so, they will have erred, as this is manifestly not an activist course. And I would say, we need to see actions, not words. I mean, you can say you're not activist all day long, but if your actions basically match the textbook definition of judicial activism, then that's activism, okay? Now, in a later interview, Judge Jones sort of said that, you know, people will say that I'm an activist just because they disagree with my ruling, okay? Well, this is not why we're saying he's an activist. We're saying he's an activist because his actions match textbook legal scholar definitions of judicial activism. So let's look at another example. In another situation, uh, Judge Jones actually said he hoped that, quote, his ruling could serve as a primer for school boards and other people who are considering this issue. So essentially what Judge Jones is, uh, is doing here is he is trying to influence parties outside his case. He wants his ruling to not just influence the Dover School Board and the parents who sued them trying to get ID banned, he wants his ruling to influence other people elsewhere who are considering the same issue of teaching intelligent design. That is the definition of judicial activism where you are trying to sort of serve as a broad policymaker around the whole country rather than simply you know, settling the issue before you in the case. So this, you know, that when we say that Judge Jones was a judicial activist, this is not just a, a meaningless epithet which, says, which implies we just disagree with what he said, no. This is a term that is well understood in scholarly legal circles, and it's applied to judges who succumb to the temptation to, quote, increase their impact as policymakers. Uh, this is a quote from a, uh, a legal scholar uh, book. And so when they do this, they're engaging in judicial activism. Judge Jones, by his own admission, wanted to be a policymaker. He wanted his, his ruling to influence other school boards and other people elsewhere around the country. Um, here's a, uh, uh, basically what legal scholars say is that judicial activism tends to displace other branches of government or other institutions in society that are better equipped to resolve a dispute. Okay, so what am I talking about? In the United States, obviously we have our three branches of government. We have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. According to our American form of government, the legislative branch makes the laws, the executive branch executes the laws, and the judicial branch gets to interpret the law. They don't make the law. And so the legislative branch, in this case, they would be the branch, so to speak, that would be setting the law when it comes to a school board curriculum. So school boards essentially belong to the legislative branch in that when a school district adopts a curriculum, it is enacting a law or a policy that dictates what has to be taught in public schools. Now, a, a, a court has the right and actually the, the obligation and the authority to interpret that and to decide whether or not a school board curriculum violates the First Amendment. So if Judge Jones finds that Dover's ID policy violates the First Amendment, it establishes religion, he has every right and authority to do that. And there's nothing wrong with the fact that Judge Jones did that in this case. But what Judge Jones tried to do was he tried to go further and decide whether or not that is even a good curriculum. And that is a no-no for federal courts. They're not supposed to decide 
whether or not a curriculum is a good curriculum or whether or not maybe a particular scientific concept ought to be included in a, uh, in a curriculum, all they can do is decide whether or not a concept is religion as respects the First Amendment, all they can do is decide whether or not a concept in the curriculum establishes religion. And there's a very nice statement of this policy of judicial restraint that Judge Jones didn't follow in the Smith v. Uh, v. Board of School Commissioners of Mobile County case from the 11th Circuit. And here's what the court said in that case. It said, the wisdom of an educational policy or its efficiency from an educational point of view is not germane to the constitutional issue of whether that policy violates the Establishment Clause. This is very good law right here. This is very good legal reasoning. But Judge Jones didn't just decide whether or not the Dover School Board violates the Establishment Clause. He went into a lengthy analysis of whether ID is good science, whether it's been refuted by Darwinian evolution, whether or not it you know, is, is an accurate description of the world around us. Um, that was not, that is not what a federal court is supposed to be doing. It was not Judge Jones's place to decide whether or not ID or Darwinian evolution is correct, it was his job to decide whether or not the Dover School Board policy violates the Establishment Clause. And the question of whether or not ID is a good idea, you know, as a scientific concept, whether or not it's a good idea to include it in the curriculum, or whether or not uh, it's better or worse than Darwinian evolution when it comes to the evidence, none of that is, is uh, germane to the constitutional issue of whether Dover's ID policy violates the Establishment Clause. But Judge Jones did not get this distinction. And that's why he went into a lengthy analysis of whether or not ID is good science. Not just whether it's science, but whether it's, it's good science, whether it's true or not. Um, here's another, and we'll talk, by the way, in just a minute about some of the scientific flaws in Judge Jones's ruling. Um, so talking about the, the principle of judicial restraint, uh, this goes all the way back to a famous U.S. Supreme Court case called Village of Euclid versus Ambler Realty Company back in the 1920s. And the, the Supreme Court, uh, in this case, has been cited many times over the years. The Supreme Court said, in the realm of constitutional law, especially, this court has perceived the embarrassment which is likely to result from an attempt to formulate rules or decide questions beyond the necessities of the immediate issue. It is preferred to follow the method of a gradual approach to the general by, systematic, by a systematically guarded application and extension of constitutional principles to particular cases as they arise, rather than by out-of-hand attempts to establish general rules to which future cases must be fitted. Now, this is the U.S. Supreme Court saying this. They have the right to be the supreme law of the land. Judge Jones was from the lowest level of the federal courts. If there's ever a time where a court is supposed to use judicial restraint, and only try to settle the immediate necessities of the issues before them in a case, it's when you're a federal trial court judge. Instead, Judge Jones tried to settle all of these broad questions. How do we define science? Is ID science? Is the type 3 secretory system a precursor to the flagellum? He even tried to decide whether evolution conflicts with religion. So what the Supreme Court recommended for a judicial restraint in this case is pretty much the opposite of what Judge Jones did. And I would say that one of the most uh, dangerous parts of Judge Jones' rulings is that it is a threat to religious liberty. It's not just judicial activism but and bad constitutional law. It's a threat to religious liberty. So here's an interesting statement that Judge Jones said. He said, both defendants and many of the leading proponents of ID make a bedrock assumption which is utterly false. Their presupposition is that evolutionary theory is antithetical to a belief in the existence of a supreme being and to religion in general. Okay? Now, does Judge Jones have the right to personally believe that it's utterly false to say that evolution conflicts with religion? Of course. If he personally wants to believe that evolution has no conflict with religion and that it's utterly false to believe that evolution conflicts with religion, that's fine. I mean, he's a citizen of this country. He has every right to believe that. But as, a, a, as an officer of a, of a U.S. government court, of a federal court, he has no business going around trying to address the question of whether evolution conflicts with religion or whether it's utterly false if people say that their religious beliefs do conflict with evolution. Okay? This is the exact opposite of what a federal court is supposed to say. Um, here's a beautiful statement from the U.S. Supreme Court. And, you know, again, religion, the field of religion and the law can be very murky and unclear. But this is one area where it's really, really, really clear. And essentially what the Supreme Court says is that a court should never 
say what is orthodox in religion. Here's what the court said. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion. But here we have a federal court judge saying that it is utterly false to believe that evolution is antithetical to belief in the existence of a supreme being and to religion in general. I mean, look, whether or not Judge Jones is right, we can debate that all day long, but a federal court has no business prescribing what is orthodox in matters of whether evolution conflicts with religion. But yet Judge Jones got this basic principle of constitutional law wrong. I wouldn't even call this a rookie error. I mean, this is an error that really no federal court judge should ever make. So it's very interesting because because of all this, we saw that actually some leading anti-ID legal scholars were very critical of Judge Jones's ruling. And in fact, a leading anti-ID legal scholar named Jay Wexler, he's a professor of law at Boston University. He's written a number of law review articles in the technical legal, legal literature critiquing. You know, he's, he argues against the teaching of ID. But here's what he said in a law review article published about the Kitzmiller ruling. He says, the part of Kitzmiller that finds ID not to be science is unnecessary, unconvincing, not particularly suited to the ju judicial role, and perhaps even dangerous both to science and to freedom of religion. Wow. Wow. To have a leading anti-ID legal scholar say this, and by the way, he agrees with Judge Jones's overall view that ID is unconstitutional to teach in public schools, okay? But he says that this big part of the, of the Dover ruling that finds ID not to be science is unnecessary, unconvincing, unconvincing, not particularly suited to the judicial role, and perhaps even dangerous to both science and to freedom of religion. I mean, you don't find a, 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 a legal scholar saying stuff like that when they agree with the fundamental position of a judge very often. And so when a lot of folks will say, well, Judge Jones, he was appointed by George W. Bush, as if somehow that's supposed to mean that I guess he, he has to agree with every ideological view of the president that appointed him. Well, here we have somebody who very much agrees with Judge Jones's overall ideology about intelligent design, but very strongly disagrees with his ruling on whether ID is science. So that's very striking, and I think that a lot of the, the activism and a lot of the overstretch that Judge Jones did in his ruling helps explain why Jay, somebody like Jay Wexler would have said this. Okay, So um, we talked a couple minutes ago about how Judge Jones uh, tried to not just say that ID wasn't science, but he tried to say that it was bad science. And it's refuted. It's been refuted. Okay, And he actually made this part of his test about whether ID is science. Okay, So he said in the ruling that ID's negative attacks on evolution have been refuted by the scientific community. Well, first of all, what's wrong with the statement? Well, just because something has been refuted doesn't mean it isn't science. Okay, We can have all kinds of scientific theories that are wrong. I mean, the history of science is filled with legitimate scientific theories that have been found to be false. So like ether theory, for example. Um, that was disproven by experiments over 100 years ago. Or the, the scientific theory that we live in an eternal universe was disproven by a lot of the evidence that supports the Big Bang. All kinds of theory, the, the history of science is littered with scientific theories that have nonetheless been proven false. Yet Judge Jones used the question of whether or not ID's arguments have been refuted as part of his test of whether ID is science to begin with. And again, any good philosopher of science will know that just you can have something be science, but it can be wrong science or bad science. And so uh, I don't think ID is bad science, but whether or not ID has been refuted is not relevant to the question of whether or not ID is science. In fact, normally, if you can refute something, that's taken as a good piece of evidence that it is testable, and it is falsifiable, and it is science. Uh, so I think that Judge Jones used some very poor philosophy of science here in looking at whether ID has been quote unquote refuted by the scientific community in his assessment of whether ID is science. Okay, that aside, that aside um, let's look at just a few of his um, arguments that ID has been refuted. And by the way, all of this is getting what, into what I just spoke about a minute ago, where I said that Judge Jones was sort of asking whether or not it was wise or good policy to include ID in the curriculum. And a, and a court has no business determining what is a good or a bad uh, academic policy. Um, Judge Jones really had no business assessing that question when all he was really supposed to be doing was asking whether or not um, Dover's policy violates the First Amendment. Okay, so here's what Judge Jones ruled. He said the argument of irreducible complexity central to ID 
employs the same kind of logical and contrived dualism that doomed creation science in the 1980s. Irreducible complexity is a negative argument against evolution, not proof of intelligent design. Irreducible complexity fails to make a positive case, scientific case for ID. Is that really true? And what do the Dover um, testimony say? Does irreducible complexity commit the old God in the gaps fallacy where it says, because something is wrong, therefore ID is right? Well, here's a statement that was documented to Judge Jones in the Dover case. Um, this is from a paper that Stephen Meyer and Scott Minnick wrote. It says, in all irreducibly complex systems in which the cause of the system is known by experience or observation, intelligent design or engineering played a role in the origin of the system. It goes on to say, although some may argue this is merely an argument from ignorance, we regard it as an inference to the best explanation, given what we know about the powers of intelligence as opposed to strictly natural or material causes. So clearly, ir irreducible complexity can be a positive argument for design. Because in our experience, all irreducibly complex features derive from intelligent agents. Um, this is from Scott Minnick's testimony, and I think we saw this earlier. He says, the positive argument is that we know when we find irreducibly complex systems or information storage and processing systems from our own experience of cause and effect that there is an intelligence associated with it. There is a uniformitarian deduction from cause and effect that we know from our everyday experience. So according to Scott Minnick's testimony, irreducible complexity makes a positive argument for design. It's not just a negative. It can be seen as a negative argument against Darwinian evolution, sure. But it can also be a positive argument for design. So that's an error that Judge Jones made. Um, and uh, so irreducible complexity is based upon what we do know, not what we don't know. And we'll discuss uh, some of Scott Minnick's experiments testing irreducible complexity in more detail in just a moment here. So Judge Jones stated that the bacterial flagellum, which is sort of this archetypal example of design, um, has been refuted as an example of irreducible complexity, and it's been shown that the bacterial flagellum could evolve. Here's what he said. He said, in the case of the bacterial flagellum, removal of a part may prevent it from acting as a rotary motor. However, Professor Behe excludes, by definition, the possibility that a precursor to the bacterial flagellum function not as a rotary motor, but in some other way, for example, as a secretory system. Okay? So let's talk about the bacterial flagellum really quickly and whether or not Judge Jones is correct that this secretory system could have served as an evolutionary precursor to the bacterial flagellum. So the bacterial flagellum is basically an inboard rotary engine on bacteria that propels it through some kind of a liquid medium to find fo food. Um, it's a self-assembled and repair water-cooled rotary engine. It's driven by a proton motor flow, although the exact mechanism is unknown. It has two gears, forward and reverse. It can change directions in a quarter of a turn. That becomes pretty impressive when you realize that it can spin at up to 18,000 RPM, and uh, actually it's been clocked at up to 100,000 RPM, and there's about 50 genes that produce over 30 structural parts. And what's interesting about the flagellum is that many of those structural parts resemble parts we recognize from human designs. It has a rotor, it has a stator, it has a U-joint, it has a propeller, there even is a brake that helps to slow down the flagellum. And its basic design is very similar to that of a rotary engine. That's why David DeRosier, a, an evolutionist, not an ID proponent, says more so than other motors, the flagellum resembles a machine designed by a human. And he even found that the energetic efficiency of the flagellum could be as high as 100%. That's very impressive. That certainly dwarfs the energetic efficiency of anything that we human beings have made. So uh, Judge Jones said that, um, that Michael Behe has been refuted because there could have been a secretory system which served as an evolutionary precursor to the flagellum. Well, is that true? Has Michael Behe been refuted? Well, it turns out that various scientific authorities disagree with Judge Jones. Here's a quote from a paper in the journal Trends in Microbiology, uh, which talks about whether or not this secretory system, called the Type 3 secretory system, could have served as a precursor to the flagellum. And here's what the quote says. It says, regarding the bacterial flagellum and Type 3 secretory systems, we must first consider three and only three possibilities. First, the TTSS, that's short for Type 3 secretory system. First, the TTSS came first. Second, the flagellar system came first. Or third, both systems evolved from a common precursor. At present, too little information is available to distinguish between these possibilities with certainty. As is often true in evaluating evolutionary arguments, 
The investigator must rely on logical deduction and intuition. According to my own intuition and the arguments discussed above, I have a pathway too. Basically, that the flagellum came first, before the type 3 secretory system, and the type 3 secretory system could not have been a precursor to the flagellum. Here's a quote from an article in the journal News, in the uh, magazine New Scientist. It says, one fact in favor of the flagellum first view is that bacteria would have needed propulsion before they needed type 3 secretory systems, which are used to attack cells later than bacteria. What's he talking about? Well, basically, type 3 secretory systems are used by predatory bacteria that go up to large eukaryotic cells and inject those cells with toxins using the type 3 secretory system to then kill those cells. Okay? Now, the problem for the evolutionary argument that the type 3 secretory system was a precursor to the flagellum is that eukaryotes evolved very late in the history of life, probably around 1 to 2 billion years ago, whereas flagella are thought to have been necessary in some of the earliest bacterial cells going back to 3 billion years ago. So it's according to the standard evolutionary wisdom, uh, bacterial flagella would have evolved long before eukaryotes evolved, but the type 3 secretory system in its other use is used only to in invade and kill eukaryotic cells. So it doesn't make sense to say that the type 3 secretory system predates the flagellum. But there's another much more stronger argument for why the flagellum probably came first before the type 3 secretory system. And this quote goes on to say, um, flagella are found in a more diverse range of bacterial species than the type 3 secretory system. And as a quote from the scientist Howard Ackman at the University of Arizona, the most parsimonious explanation is that the type 3 secretory system arose later. So this next quote explains this. Uh, this is from a, an Evolution 2012 paper. It says, based on patchy taxonomic distribution of the type 3 secretory system compared to that of the flagellum, widespread in bacterial phyla, previous phylogenetic analyses proposed that the type 3 secretory system derived from flagellar ancestor and spread later through lateral gene transfer. Okay? So what am I talking about here? Essentially, when you look at the way that bacterial flagella are distributed among bacteria today, they're distributed very, very widely. And in this tree diagram you see right now, you can see that the green, actually in this diagram, every single clade in this tree has flagella, including both the green and the purple. So bacterial flagella are distributed very widely among bacterial phyla. This is just a representative schematic of what I'm talking about. But type 3 secretory systems are only found in the purple groups, okay? So type 3 secretory systems are found in a very narrow, restricted range of bacteria today, whereas flagella are found very widespread among bacteria. What this suggests is that bacteria are very ancient in the history, I'm sorry, what this suggests is that flagella are very ancient in the history of bacteria, because they go back perhaps even as far back as one of the, the most ancient common ancestors of all bacteria. And because type 3 secretory systems are found in only a very narrow range of bacteria, that suggests that it's a very late innovation in the history of life, and it certainly does not predate the flagella. If it did, you, expect, you would expect it to be more widely distributed than flagella. Instead, you find the opposite, that flagella are much more widely distributed than the type 3 secretory system and the injectosome that it's a part of. So this is very important. Normal evolutionary analysis would look at this and say, Oh my goodness, of course, the type 3 secretory system must have evolved after the flagellum. That would be a normal evolutionary analysis of this kind of data. But the fact that they don't do that shows that they're looking for some kind of evolutionary precursor to the flagellum, even though the type 3 secretory system is not supported by the data as being that. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that there is some very strong evidence that the type 3, the secretory system, which Judge Jones claims could have been a precursor to the flagellum, could not have been a precursor. Now, of course, you can get Ken Miller in the courtroom and have him testify that it could have been a precursor, and then you can get Michael Behe and Scott Minnick in there, and they can testify that, you know what, there are good reasons why the type 3 secretory system was not a precursor to the flagellum. What Judge Jones has here is not evidence that I.D.'s arguments have been refuted, he has evidence of a scientific debate. A debate that he ought to be staying out of, because, sci because courts have no business trying to settle these kinds of scientific debates. Let's let the scientists settle these debates, and if a school board wants to take a side, that's their prerogative as a member of the legislative branch of our government. 
But a federal court can only decide constitutional issues in cases like this. It has no business trying to settle the scientific debate, and it's not even relevant to whether or not ID is science or religion. Uh, Judge Jones also claimed that Michael Behe ignores exaptation or indirect, indirect roots of evolution. But uh, he doesn't do that. If you read Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box, he certainly allows for indirect roots. He just says that the more indirect the evolutionary story becomes, the less likely it is to happen. But he says on pages uh, uh, 65 to 66, because the psyllium is irreducibly complex, no direct gradual root leads to its production. So an evolutionary story for the psyllium must envision a circuitous route, perhaps adapting parts that were originally used for other purposes. So when Judge Jones claims that Michael Behe ignores exaptation or indirect roots of evolution, Behe does not ignore it. He's saying right here, he's talking about exaptation, indirect roots of evolution that use parts that were originally used for other purposes. Uh, bottom line is that Judge Jones just got this wrong, and he misstated Behe's uh, definition of irreducible complexity. But I think one of the, the biggest problems with Judge Jones's discussion of irreducible complexity is that he misdefined how we test irreducible complexity. And he did that because he adopted basically a test for irreducible complexity that was given by Ken Miller, a pro, I'm sorry, an anti-ID biologist that testified against ID in the case. Ken Miller said during his testimony that this is how we test irreducible complexity. He said, Dr. Behe's prediction is that the parts of any irreducibly complex system should have no useful function. Therefore, we ought to be able to take the bacterial flagellum, for example, break its parts down, and discover that none of the parts are good for anything except when we're all assembled in a flagellum. Now, that is not how we test for irreducible complexity. And let me explain to you why that's the case. Let's consider an arch. An arch is often said to be an example of an irreducibly complex structure. It requires all of its components in order for it to stand up and function. So in, right now in this arch, all the parts are functioning. Let's say we break this arch down into all these different parts, including S and T. Okay? Now let's say that we remove part T. Well, the arch falls down, right? But part S actually can stand on its own. So what I'm saying here, what you're seeing here, is that just because one part of an irreducibly complex structure might be able to have some other function does not mean that you can assemble the overall irreducibly complex system in a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step manner. So the only way to properly test irreducibly complex uh, systems is to take one part of the system out at a time and see if the whole system can function, not to see if one part can have a function on its own. Uh, for example, I mean, I could take my laptop's power cord and use it to power a toaster, okay? That doesn't mean that my toaster could evolve into my laptop in a step-by-step-by-step -step -step fashion. It's an improper way to test irreducibly complex systems. So um, this applies to the bacterial flagellum. Uh, Scott Minnick testified about how when you look at the type 3 secretory system, yes, it does share some of the components of the flagellum, but it's very different from the flagellum. He was asked, would it be fair to say that if the type 3 secretory system was found to have preceded the bacterial flagellum, we'd still have difficulty with trying to determine how one system that functions as a secretory system could then become a separate system that functions as a motor, a flagellar motor. And Minix says in response, right, having a nano syringe and developing that into a rotary engine, you know, is a big leap. So the problem is that just because one part of the flagellum is similar to this type 3 secretory system does not mean that you can evolve that secretory system into the full-blown flagellar motor function in a step-by-step-by-step -step -step manner. So this uh, co-option scheme, uh, this, this evolutionary scheme that the type 3 secretory system evolves in the flagellum is not an evolutionary pathway. Uh, I think that William Densky puts it really well. He says, at best, the type 3 secretory system represents one possible step in the indirect Darwinian evolution of the bacterial flagellum. But that still wouldn't constitute the solution to the evolution of the bacterial flagellum. What's needed is a complete evolutionary path and not merely a possible oasis along the way. To claim otherwise is like saying we can travel by foot from Los Angeles to Tokyo because we've discovered the Hawaiian Islands. Evolutionary biology needs to be better than that. I think this is a very nice statement from William Dembski about why the bacterial flagellum, the type 3 secretory system, is not 
a good evolutionary precursor to the flagellum or how it certainly does not provide some kind of a Darwinian evolutionary pathway. So what Judge Jones has here is evidence of a scientific debate. Fine, Ken Miller thinks that the irreducibly complex, uh, the, the flagellum is not irreducibly complex. Michael Behe and Scott Minnick think it is. It's not Judge Jones' business to settle that dispute. Um, what's interesting, though, is if you look at one thing that Judge Jones said, he actually kind of gave away the store without realizing it. In one case, he says, in the case of the bacterial flagellum, removal of a part may prevent it from acting as a rotary motor. Well, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. And that seems like an important fact. And that is, in fact, a, a correct way, a proper way of testing for irreducible complexity. And that's exactly what Scott Minnick did during uh, his uh, testimony. He testified about the experiments he did on the bacterial flagellum showing that it is irreducible complex. He said, one mutation, one part knockout, it can't swim. Put that single gene back in, we restore motility. We put knock one part out, put a good copy of the gene back in, and they can swim. By definition, the system is irreducibly complex. We've done that with all 35 components of the flagellum, and we get the same effect. So what Scott Minnick did is he took the bacterial flagellum, and one by one, he knocked out each of its 35 or so structural components, and he showed that every one of them is needed in order for the flagellum to function. And that shows, experimentally, by definition, that the bacterial flagellum is irreducibly complex. Unfortunately, uh, Judge Jones uh, miss, didn't even mention Scott Minnick's uh, experiments, and he ignored the fact that Scott Minnick had showed the flagellum is irreducibly complex. So um, the question is, again, did Judge Jones settle this debate? Was this debate over that bacterial flagellum was it settled at the Dover case? And the reality is that not only was it not settled at Dover, but it's still ongoing. Uh, this is a statement by a biophysicist, Matt ba Baker, who wrote an article in July 2015 where he said, I don't think we actually need to show directly that an injectosome, that's part of the type 3 secretory system similar to that, I don't think we need to directly show that an injectosome can be step-by-step -step evolved into a flagellum. The field of experimental evolution is very young. So what he's saying is we still don't have this is a biophysicist admitting in 2015, this guy is actually arguing against the evolution, I'm sorry, against the irreducible complexity of the bacterial flagellum. He's arguing against intelligent design in this article. Here he is saying that we don't have a step-by-step -step account for the bacterial flagellum, and we shouldn't expect that because he says the field of experimental evolution is very young. In fact, after the Dover trial, um, a paper in Nature Reviews Microbiology says the flagella research community has scarcely begun to consider how these systems have evolved. So yes, there is an ongoing debate about whether or not the flagellum could evolve. Um, I think that there are good arguments that uh, the flagellum could not have evolved in a step-by-step -step manner, and many pro-ID scientists would agree with me. And there are, of course, evolutionary scientists who disagree. That's fine. This is evidence of a scientific debate. It's not one that shows that ID is not science or that it's unconstitutional, and it's certainly not one that the judiciary should be getting itself into, as Judge Jones tried to in the Dover case. So again, what we see here is evidence of a scientific debate, not a refutation of intelligent design. So much more can be written about Judge Jones' scientific errors. We're going to have to leave it at this for now, and we're going to talk about what I think is Judge Jones' most dangerous error in this case. Okay? It's where he said that ID is not science because it has failed to gain acceptance in the scientific community. Why is this dangerous? Well, what it says is that something is only science if it has gained acceptance in the scientific community. Well, if this is true, how can science ever progress? Every new scientific theory that ends up, you know, maybe taking over and winning everyone over, every new scientific theory starts off as a minority scientific view that virtually nobody accepts. Now, over time, that scientific theory might become accepted in the scientific community. But if Judge Jones is right here that something cannot be science, if it has failed to gain acceptance, then no scientific revolution can ever take place, and science can never progress. So Judge Jones' ruling here, it's very bad philosophy of science. It also threatens the ability of new scientific theories to be able to be considered by scientists. Now, thankfully, and Judge Jones probably didn't realize this when he ruled this, the Supreme Court already ruled on whether or not general acceptance is a good test of whether or not something A is science or B is good science. And they did this in the Daubert versus Merrill Dale pharmaceutical case, where basically the US Supreme Court explicitly rejected 
the general acceptance test as a requirement for being good science. And this is actually the central holding of this case. The court said, nothing in the text of this rule establishes general acceptance as an absolute prereq prerequisite to admissibility. They're talking about whether or not the federal rules of evidence for scientific evidence in a court case uh, should require general acceptance of an idea before a scientific claim can be accepted or brought in as evidence in a court case. And the court said, no, you don't have to have general acceptance before you have uh, this scientific concept admitted as evidence in a case. And so the court basically rejected the very general acceptance test that Judge Jones tried to invoke in saying this is a, a requisite of being, uh, of being science. It's very dangerous to the progress of science. Um, thankfully, other scientists also disagree with Judge Jones. Here's a statement from an amicus brief in the Dauber case uh, that was co-signed by Stephen Jay Gould and a variety of other scientists. They said, judgments based on scientific evidence, whether made in a laboratory or a courtroom, are undermined by a categorical refusal to even consider research or views that contradict someone's notion of the prevailing consensus of scientific opinion. Automatically rejecting dissenting views that challenge the conventional wisdom is a dangerous fallacy for almost every generally accepted view was once deem, deemed eccentric or heretical. Perpetuating the reign of a supposed scientific orthodoxy in this way, whether in a research laboratory or in a courtroom, is profoundly inimical to the search for truth. The quality of a scientific approach or opinion depends on the strength of its factual premises and on the depth of its consistency or its reasoning, not on its appearance in a particular journal or on its popularity among scientists. I mean, this statement alone refutes about three of the criteria, three or four of the criteria that Judge Jones has used for deciding whether or not ID is science. And I think it shows, it's a beautiful, eloquent statement of why it's very dangerous to say, look, just because something isn't uh, well accepted or widely accepted in the scientific community, or just because it's a new idea that hasn't been published yet in certain journals, it's very dangerous to reject an idea simply for that reason. And I think that really this, this statement here uh, shows why Judge Jones used very dangerous and poor philosophy of science uh, by adopting the general acceptance test, because it, it threatens the advancement of science. So why was Judge Jones's ruling so inaccurate? Um, why did he get so many things wrong? Why did he get so many claims inaccurate in the ruling? Well, it turns out that uh, we did analysis after Judge Jones submitted his ruling, and we found that over 90%, exact, uh, approximately 90.9% .9 of Judge Jones's celebrated section on whether intelligent design is science was taken virtually verbatim from the ACLU's proposed finding of facts and conclusions of law, which is, was submitted to Judge Jones nearly a month before his ruling. Okay? So this helps to explain why Judge Jones got so much wrong. He basically copied huge portions of his section, his celebrated section, on whether ID is science from an ACLU brief. Now, before we get into this, I want to make it clear. I'm not accusing Judge Jones of plagiarism. I'm not saying that Judge Jones did something unethical by copying uh, huge portions of a brief from uh, the ACLU. Uh, judges are allowed to do this. Now, this is frowned upon by federal courts. Uh, one of the reasons why it's frowned upon is because when a court simply copies from one party's briefs, it tends to make it look like they were not sort of careful, neutral arbiters of the facts. They didn't carefully scrutinize the arguments from both sides and come to some, you know, split the baby kind of decision in the middle. Uh, attorneys, it's their job to sort of push the envelope with arguments, right? It's supposed to be the court's job to sift through those zealous advocacy of the attorneys on both sides and come up with some sort of you know, you know, solution or decision that's somewhere in the middle. But when Judge Jones rendered his decision, he basically just signed his name to the ACLU brief uh, in the section of whether ID is science. So this, uh, not only does this tend to diminish the public's trust in the judiciary, because it makes it look like they're not being totally neutral, uh, but at all, and they're not being careful you know, scrutinizers of the truth, it also tends to incorporate errors into the ruling. And so even uh, higher courts have criticized the judicial practice of copying a brief from one party or the other because it tends to incorporate the overzealous advocacy of one party or another into the ruling. And I think that these criticisms really apply here to what Judge Jones did. So let's look at some examples of where Judge Jones simply copied from the ACLU brief and uh, incorporated errors into his ruling. So here's a good example. Um, there was this incident that took place when Michael Behe was being cross-examined during the Dober case. 
And basically, one of the Dover's attorneys, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not the Dover attorneys, one of the plaintiff's attorneys took this big stack of books and articles and dumped them on the witness stand. And they said to Michael Behe, look, here's all these papers that show how the immune system evolved, okay? And what Michael Behe did was he said, look, um, these papers, I'm sure they're very good papers, but they don't address the question that I'm asking. I'm saying that the immune system in invertebrates is irreducibly complex, and it can evol not evolve in a step-by-step -step, uh, manner. What he said is that these papers, all they tend to do is they tend to compare sequence similarity between these flagella, I'm sorry, between these immune system proteins and other proteins, and this might show common ancestry, but it does not demonstrate a step-by-step-by-step -step -step Darwinian pathway. So what he said is basically, these papers are perfectly good papers, but they're addressed to a separate question. They're not addressing my question of how the immune system evolved. So Judge Jones, after this incident, this is what he ruled. He said, he, be he, was presented with 58 peer-reviewed publications, nine books, and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune system. However, he simply insisted that this was still not sufficient evidence of evolution and that it was not, quote, good enough. So that's what Judge Jones ruled. Well, where did he get that from? Well, here's what the plaintiff's brief said. It said, he, be he, was confronted with 58 peer-reviewed publications, nine books, and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune systems, and he insisted that this was still not sufficient evidence of evolution. It was, quote, not good enough. Okay, so basically it's verbatim, okay? Almost no change whatsoever in this quote. So what did Behe actually say? Did Behe actually look at these papers and say that they were not good enough? No, that's not what Behe said. In fact, here's Behe's actual testimony. He said, these articles are excellent articles, I assume. However, they do not address the question that I am posing. So it's not that they aren't good enough, it's that they simply are addressed to a different subject. So rather than Behe saying that the papers were not good enough, he actually said that it's not that they aren't good enough. They're perfectly good papers, he says. The problem is that they are not addressing his question of what is a step-by-step -step Darwinian evolutionary explanation for the origin of the immune system. Instead, they're talking about comparing sequence similarity and trying to infer common ancestry. I mean, be he accept common ancestry, so that's not even his issue with evolution. His issue is that there's not these step-by-step -step Darwinian evolutionary pathways to show how things evolve by natural selection and random mutation. So Behe makes it really clear, and by the way, I mean, do you really think that when the, the, Dover, the, the plaintiff's attorney took this huge stack of papers and dumped them on the witness stand and sort of these courtroom theatrics, that Michael Behe, he'd been given enough time to go through these papers? Of course not. I mean, this is all courtroom theatrics. And it actually turns out that if you look at many of these papers, B was exactly right. They don't provide a, a stepwise explanation of the immune system. They simply compare sequence homology between um, genes involved in the immune system and the, and the vertebrate adaptive immune system and genes involved in other systems. They just find sequence homology. They don't provide a step-by-step -step account for how the immune system arose. So B was exactly right. But uh, unfortunately, the ACLU misquoted Behe, and then Judge Jones copied from the ACLU and said that Behe said these papers were just not good enough, when in fact, that's the opposite of what Behe said. Uh, here's another example, and this goes to one of the errors we talked about in this talk. Uh, Judge Jones said that ID is not supported by any peer-reviewed research data or publications. Uh, the plaintiff's attorney said that intelligent design is not supported by any peer-reviewed research data or publications. Okay, so what did Judge Jones do here? He changed intelligent design to ID. That's the change he made. Well, what's the reality? Is this true? No, of course it's not true. As we talked about earlier, Scott Minnick testified at trial that there were between seven and 10 peer-reviewed papers supporting ID. He discussed a pro-ID article in the journal Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, and additional peer-reviewed publications were listed to Judge Jones in the amicus brief that we helped submit. So this was a, an error that Judge Jones put in his ruling. Actually, he put this in about five places, but where did he get it from? He just copied it from the ACLU's brief. Um, here's another example. In addition to failing to produce papers in peer-reviewed journals, ID also features no scientific research or testing. Uh, what did the ACLU brief said? Besides failing to produce papers in peer-reviewed journals, intelligent design also features no scientific research or testing. Almost exactly the same, I guess, Judge Jones change the words besides to in addition. Okay, so there you go. A small change, the kind that might make a cheating high schooler bluff, sorry, the kind that might make a cheating 
high schooler blush, although this is not plagiarism. Judge Jones is allowed to do this. Um, the reality is that Scott Minnick testified about his own research on the bacterial flagellum, which shows that it was, in fact, irreducibly complex. And there was other research that was testified to Judge Jones, given it was documented in some of the amicus briefs. And so it's not the case that ID has had no scientific research or testing. Um, Judge Jones simply got this wrong because he copied from the ACLU brief. Uh, one last example here that ID requires the supernatural. Where did Judge Jones get that from? Well, he said ID is predicated on supernatural causation. ID takes a natural phenomenon and instead of accepting or seeking a natural explanation, argues that the explanation is supernatural. Now, we've already seen why that is false, but what did, where did he get this false idea from? We just copied it from the ACLU brief. Their brief said intelligent design is predicated on supernatural causation. Intelligent design takes a natural phenomenon and instead of accepting or seeking a natural explanation, argues that the explanation is supernatural. And of course, what is the reality? Both Behe and Minnick testified otherwise at trial that IE does not require supernatural causation, that it does not invoke the supernatural. Um, the court accepted an amicus brief explaining why IE does not uh, invoke the supernatural, and Judge Jones just ignored that. He did not let ID proponents define their own position. Instead, he copied the definition of ID from an ACLU brief that misrepresented ID. So there you go. We can trace back many of the false claims and the errors in Judge Jones's ruling to this inaccurate ACLU brief. Now, we would expect as much from the ACLU. I mean, after all, it's their job. They're trying to get ID banned from public schools. They want to censor intelligence design. They're going to use any argument they can, whether good or bad, and used a lot of bad ones to try to get ID censored. Judge Jones's job was to, was to sort of filter through those bad arguments and come to an accurate decision. And instead, I don't really think that he did that, despite the fact that he was called, I think Time Magazine called him one of the thinkers of the year in 2006, he really simply copied his celebrated section on weather idea science from the ACLU's brief. And I don't think it represents a court of sort of careful, cautious, objective analysis that we want to see from courts. Instead, it shows basically you know, signing your name to one party's brief. So really, many of the reasons why higher courts have criticized this practice of judicial copying apply directly to Judge Jones. It tends to incorporate errors into the ruling and it tends to diminish the public's faith in the judiciary. And I think, unfortunately, that's exactly what is happening here. So, okay, we're almost done. Let's just give a summary of some of the major problems with the Kitzmiller versus Dover ruling um, and some, some highlights of the Kitzmiller versus rule, uh, Dover ruling. First of all, the case was not appealed, and the ruling was issued from the lowest level of the federal courts. So, for that reason, the case is not binding outside of the Middle District of Pennsylvania and ID has not been banned nationwide. I would say, however, that the judicial overreach diminishes the credibility of the ruling. Uh, Judge Jones, at one point in the ruling, says that no other court is better situated than he is to address this issue of teaching intelligent design. And I think that actually future courts will have the, not just the right, but the obligation to reconsider this issue because of all the inaccurate statements in the Dover ruling and because of the overreach, the judicial activism that Judge Jones engaged in. In fact, the extensive copying from the plaintiff's findings of fact and conclusions of law diminishes the credibility of whether the uh, of, on the section of whether ID is science. Um, so other problems, the ruling attacked a false definition of ID, wrongly holding that ID requires supernatural creation, a position that was refuted during the trial by ID proponents who testified and gave other evidence to the judge that ID does not require the supernatural. Uh, the ruling also ignored the positive case for design and falsely claimed that ID proponents make their case solely by arguing against evolution. Uh, Judge Jones misrepresented the Pandas and People textbook as if it supported creationism when in fact its thesis was fundamentally distinct from creationism and did not fit in with how creationism has been declared a religion by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Judge Jones used this six-part test for analyzing whether ID is science, yet on each of those six parts his analysis was either, was either wrong or irrelevant. Um, criterion one, ID and the supernatural. Uh, Judge Jones' analysis was wrong because ID does not invoke the supernatural, and, it was, uh, and, it's, uh, and whether ID permits the supernatural is irrelevant to determining whether ID is science. On criterion two, uh, the negative arguments against evolution. Here, Judge Jones' analysis is wrong 
because ID, including its arguments from irreducible complexity, offer a strong positive argument for design. Judge Jones ignored this. His analysis here is also irrelevant because determining whether ID is science uh, is, is, it doesn't matter whether scientists are using negative arguments in determining whether something is science. Scientists will use negative arguments all the time. Criterion three, um, ID and scientific disproof, uh, you know, has ID been refuted by the scientific community? Here Judge Jones' analysis is wrong. He was presented evidence of a scientific debate, not one side refuting the other. And in fact, many of Judge Jones' arguments for why ID has been refuted turn out to themselves be wrong. Moreover, his analysis here is irrelevant, because even if he were correct that ID had been refuted, that doesn't mean that ID is therefore not scientific or that it's therefore religion. The, the history of science is littered with ideas that have been refuted, but yet are still properly considered scientific. Uh, criterion four, ID and acceptance in the scientific community. Here Judge Jones' analysis is wrong because there are credible scientists who support ID, but his analysis is also irrelevant because even the U.S. Supreme Court has express, expressly rejected the view that the degree of support for an idea determines whether it is scientific. Uh, criterion five, ID and peer review. Here Judge Jones' analysis is wrong because ID has generated peer-reviewed publications. It's also irrelevant to determining whether ID is science because as we saw, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that you can have something be good science even if it has not been published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, and then finally, criterion six, ID and research. Here Judge Jones' analysis is wrong because such research indeed exists and it was the subject of his testimony in his courtroom. It's also irrelevant to determining whether ID is science. An idea could be scientific and yet not have yet been tested. Okay, other problems. Um, he blatantly ignored and denied the existence of pro-ID peer-reviewed scientific publications that were documented to him and were even the subject of testimony in his own courtroom. He blatantly ignored and denied the existence of pro-ID scientific research and data that was likewise the subject of testimony in his own courtroom. He blundered in his application of philosophy of science, presuming that being wrong precludes being scientific and by applying a false dichotomy where he argued that if something isn't science, then it must be religion. He dangerously stifles scientific advance by taking the level of support for a theory as a measure of whether, whether it is scientific or not. He made many, or at least many, easily challenged scientific claims that were inaccurate uh, about the evolution of the bacterial flagellum, the blood clotting cascade, the origin of new genetic information, and the immune system. And he overstepped the bounds of the judiciary and engaged in judicial activism. He found that I'd even refuted when in fact he'd been presented with credible scientific witnesses and publications on both sides showing evidence of a scientific debate. He also adopted an unfair double standard of legal analysis where religious implications, beliefs, and motives and affiliations count against ID, but never against Darwinism. And he violated a fundamental cardinal rule of constitutional law by declaring a religious view to be false from the bench of a US court, namely the view that religion conflicts with evolution, or that evolution conflicts with religion, I should say. So dare I say it, I would say that the Dover ruling is actually a case study and why we don't want judges trying to settle controversial scientific and social questions. Judge Jones got many things wrong, and it was a textbook case in many cases of judicial activism. So the last part of this is I want to talk about this claim that we've heard from quite a few ID critics that somehow Dover killed intelligent design, that ID is dead in the post-Dover era. Well, that was 10 years ago in December of 2005 that ID was ruled against in the Kitzmiller versus Dover case. And in the last 10 years, the reality is that ID has thrived in the post-Dover era. We have seen dozens of pro-ID, peer-reviewed scientific papers being published. We have seen experimental research coming out in peer-reviewed papers showing the unevolvability of new proteins and that proteins contain high levels of complex and specified information. We have seen theoretical peer-reviewed papers taking down alleged computer simulations of evolution, including one I didn't talk about called the VITA that was testified about by Robert Pennock during the Dover trial. And these theoretical papers have showed that intelligent design is needed to produce new information. We've seen a major ID research conference at, the, at Cornell leading to the publication of the volume Biological Information New Perspectives, where dozens of ID researchers contributed their research into a peer-reviewed scientific book. 
We've seen huge victories for ID in terms of ID predictions about junk DNA. It's been in the post-over world that the ENCODE results have come out showing that the vast majority of our DNA is in fact functional, validating a prediction that ID has made. So we've seen data supporting of ID coming out all the time, especially as the epigenetic revolution has proceeded. We now know that epigenetics has revealed new layers of information and biological control throughout the cell. And this is exactly what ID has predicted. So it's a very exciting time to be an ID proponent, seeing so many new types of information and new layers of cellular regulation and control being discovered. Because this is exactly what ID proponents have said we would find in the cell. As well as, of course, function for all this non-coding DNA, that that information is useful and important as well. Um, I would say ID pretty much shut down the competition in debates relating to Stephen Meyer's books, like Darwin's Doubt and Signature in the Cell. Signature in the Cell was named one of the books of the year by the London uh, Times uh, Literary Supplement. And Darwin's Doubt was appraised by one of the top scientific journals, the journal Science, in a tellingly weak review. And when Stephen Meyer debated the author of that review in uh, a radio debate, uh, that author, uh, who criticized Stephen Meyer's book in the journal Science, essentially what came out is that he didn't have any explanation for the evolutionary origin of new information. Um, interestingly, uh, Judge Jones didn't mention this in his ruling, but one of Ken Miller's number one arguments against ID during the Dover trial was the beta globin pseudogene and his claim that it is a non-functional piece of junk DNA that is broken and shared in both humans and apes, and this is evidence of our common ancestry with apes. Well, that argument was shot down in 2013 as a paper reported function for the beta globin pseudogene. Um, in another case, one of the um, sort of evolution lobby's favorite arguments against Michael Behe was refuted as chloroquine resistance has turned out to be a multi-mutation feature that requires multiple mutations to be present before you get any advantage. So these are both vindications of ID arguments here. Um, we've seen major concessions from leading atheists like Thomas Nagel that ID arguments have merit and should be taken seriously and concessions from influential evolutionists that neo-Darwinism indeed faces serious criticisms in biology. A leading theistic evolutionist who is not an ID proponent named Daryl Falk um, admitted when he was responding to Stephen Meyer's book Darwin's Doubt that in fact neo-Darwinism does face major criticisms from the scientific community. So we're seeing major concession concessions from leading evolutionary scientists. And I would say revealingly, the more that we see ID victories, the more the Darwin lobby has tried to suppress free speech for ID proponents and in turn is forced to squelch their own criticisms of the orthodox evolutionary paradigm. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, book, Biological Information New Perspectives, that was the conference proceedings from this ID research conference at Cornell in 2012. The Darwin lobby actually successfully prevented that book from being published by one of the world's top science publishers, Springer Verlag. Now, they did this because they were trying to say, you know, Springer should not publish an ID book. So the Darwin lobby is very scared of ID arguments getting out there. Thankfully, another scientific publisher, World Scientific, had the courage to take up that book and publish it. But as I said at the very beginning of this talk, we have seen an intense spike in the amount of persecution of ID proponents in the post-over era. Many of the, some of the stories of scientists who have been discriminated against um, were told in the 2008 documentary, Expelled, no Intelligence Allowed, uh, which is a documentary featuring comedian Ben Stein recounting various high-profile cases against pro-ID scientists like Carolyn Crocker at George Mason University or Guillermo Gonzalez at the University or I, 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 sorry, Iowa State University or uh, Bob Marks at Baylor University or the Richard, uh, Richard Sternberg at the Smithsonian. Um, these cases were retold and expelled and it shows how the Darwin lobby is doing what it can do to prevent ID arguments from getting out there. And guess what? The Kitzmiller versus Dover case is part of that agenda. What were they trying to do in the Dover case? They were trying to get intelligent design banned from schools in the Dover school district. And they successfully did that, unfortunately. So what the Darwin lobby wants to do is they want to censor and ban this idea of intelligent design, both from public schools and from academia. Public schools, they use court cases like the Dover case. And in academia, they persecute ID-friendly scientists to try to get them expelled from the universities. Uh, and that documentary, Expelled, by the way, was watched by over 100, I'm sorry, by over 1.1 million viewers. And it's great to see 
that Ai's message is getting out into the culture as a whole in the post-over era, despite the efforts of the Darwin lobby to squelch ID arguments. We've also seen some major public policy victories in the post-over era. Um, people said that you know, Dover would kill the ID movement. Well, the ID movement was not asking for ID to be pushed into public schools before Dover, and it has not asked that after Dover either. either. But what we have seen is that since Dover, five states have adopted policies that either require or permit teaching the controversy over evolution in public schools, and this is great. We've seen that in South Carolina, Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana, and Tennessee, and that brings it to a total of 10 states around the country now that either require or permit teaching uh, the evidence for and against evolution in public schools. And we've seen millions of hits, of course, on Discovery Institute's nude site, evolutionnews.org, and downloads of our ID of the Future podcast. So the message about ID is getting out there, despite the Darwin Lobby's attempts to sort of uh, you know, squelch the ID message, I think the more they try to suppress ID, the more people are getting interested in it. And perhaps for me, as research coordinator at Discovery Institute, one of my most encouraging uh, things that I see about the ID movement is in the last 10 years, we've had a summer program where every year students come from all over the year, uh, all over the world, to Seattle to learn about ID from the top scientists in the world. And we've now graduated over 300 si scientists, soon to be scientists. Many of them are graduate students getting their PhDs. They're going to go on to uh, do research and do uh, work to advance the case for intelligent design. We've now graduated over 300 students from this summer seminar who are schooled in the best scientific arguments against and for ID. They understand the Dover ruling. They understand what Judge Jones got wrong. And they're not going to be fooled by these bad arguments from the Darwin lobby. And they're out there today making, uh, furthering the case for intelligent design. And so what we see is that the fundamentals of intelligent design are very sound. When we look at peer-reviewed scientific papers, discoveries in the scientific community, and an up-and-coming generation of ID-friendly scientists and scholars who understand ID and are not going to be fooled by the false uh, critics version of ID that unfortunately was canonized into law in the Dover case. So the take-home point here, if, there, if you hear nothing that I've talked about in the last two hours, is that federal judges cannot settle scientific debates. The day after the Dover ruling, our cells were still full of language-based digital code and miniature factories that produced micromolecular machines, and the universe remained exquisitely fine-tuned to sustain complex life. No court ruling can negate the scientific evidence for design in nature. So despite what you hear or what you don't hear in the media, because the media often doesn't talk about ID successes, the scientific fundamentals of ID are incredibly sound, and the future is looking bright. So if you want to know more, oh, so I should say this right now. We, we often hear this claim, Judge Jones was a George Bush appointee, and, and no Republican appointee would ever rule against ID unless it was so false. Well, here's news for people who make that argument. A leading anti-ID legal scholar, the kind of person who is heavily predisposed to agree with Judge Jones, said that the part of Kitzmiller that finds ID not to be science is un unnecessary, unconvincing, not particularly suited to the judicial role, and perhaps dangerous both to science and to freedom of religion. So I think the Dover ruling is not the last word on intelligent design. We are definitely, if, it, if, if another school board decides to teach ID someday, I'm not when, I don't know when that's going to be, and I'm certainly not advocating that it happen anytime soon, but if and when that does happen someday, I think we could very well see the Dover ruling being overturned and a lot of its errors being exposed. So uh, the legality of teaching ID nationwide, only one court has addressed the teaching of ID, and it was from the lowest level of the federal courts. That ruling has many weaknesses. Don't let anybody tell you that ID has been banned, and I currently consider the teaching of ID to be an unsettled legal question. For more information, you can read our book, Traipsing into Evolution, or you can go to the website, traipsingintoevolution.com. There you will also find a, a link to a law review article in Montana Law Review written by David Wolf, John West, and myself that uh, explains many of these arguments in more detail. So thank you very much.